Hi everyone, my name is Julia. I'm the co-founder of Unicorn Lab. I am happy to hold this virtual invest meetup for you today. Thanks for joining us. Please let's start from the introduction. Unicorn Lab is a Silicon Valley based consultancy company. Our team has been engaged with searching and supporting startups from different sectors for more than five years, and we have received a huge network of investors. We are excited to help the brightest minds that solve the planet's biggest challenges through disruptive solutions and technologies and make human life more ecological, healthy, and happy. Please join us on our mission. We are passionate about biohacking. We run Biohacking Congress. It is an international platform dedicated to furthering the advancement of biohacking, health optimization, biotech, digital health, health, and ecological companies. We believe that biohacking is powerful and can make positive changes for each individual and globally. That's why we build this community environment and platform for exhibition, exchange opinions between biohackers, health optimization experts, and uh, also entrepreneurs and investors from health tech, biotech industry. Please join our community, follow us on social media, and attend our events. We invite you to join Biohacking Congress in Silicon Valley on November 20th. There you can learn from more than 15 top speakers, explore selected health tech and ecological companies, and uh, meet like-minded people, friends, and partners. If you cannot join us at the venue in Menlo Park, you still can watch our live stream. We are going to live stream all day. Uh, one of the purposes of Unicorn Lab uh, is to promote beneficial cooperation between entrepreneurs and investors from biotech, health tech, wellness industries. And for selected startups, so we offer to complete our fundraising program. We offer them leverage our global community to get their brand awareness, visibility for industry investors, and of course, raise capital faster. And um, here are some of our goals and objectives during this program. We engage investors, we build investors pipeline, we uh, help startups raise capital. Here is uh, some of uh, selection criteria for startups. If you are interested in uh, this program, please apply on our website at the section for startups. Uh, we run this uh, program with our partner, Get Funded Tools, and I would like to introduce our partner, Anna Green, co-founder of Get Funded Tools. Hi, Anna. Hi, Julia. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here today. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, just, I guess, a couple of words about us. We're Get Funded Tools. We help impact companies to get funded. Uh, everything from early stages to the later stages. Specifically, we love working with Series A companies, uh, the type of companies you will guys see today on this meetup. So stay tuned. These are our favorite, favorite companies. We've selected among hundreds of health tech startups so uh, more than excited to the stage to them and of course welcome our investors on the panel today so i'm just grateful to be here and excited for the pitches thank you anna we are also excited to have you as a partner thank you very much thank you Julia. And, uh, here's our all amazing team and uh, we are happy to hold this virtual investment meetup for you today. Uh, this meetup will be started from the panel discussion about impact investment in innovation startups working to promote longevity and health span. And the second part of this meetup will be dedicated to pitch session. Uh, here is uh, selected startups. They are selected for our fundraising program and they will be presented today. Sun Health, Macromotech and Suggestic. And uh, today with us will be experienced investors. We are so honored to have them with us today. We will introduce them right after the discussion. And um, also we have such great funds with us today and accelerators. 
So now let's start um, from the panel discussion and uh, uh, let me invite to our virtual stage our experienced speakers, Kate Butts, managing partner Longevity Capital, Safa Raschi, founder and managing partner Think Plus Ventures, Brian McMahon, founder Expert Doge, Lou Jean, founder and managing partner Fusion Fund, and Paul Brosnan, managing director India Bio. Thank you. Mm, uh, first of all, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, we would like to learn more about your experience. Could you please uh, introduce yourself? Uh, okay. I think Kate will start. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to start. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting us, uh, Julia. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a managing partner for Longevity Capital, which in turn is part of a deep knowledge group. Uh, Deep Knowledge Group has uh, four components. I'm sorry, uh, which one of them is the uh, venture arm, but we also have been producing uh, open access analytics on the topic of longevity for many years, five plus years to be exact. Uh, and they, this branch is called the Agent Analytics Agency. Uh, also, we uh, work with a number of uh, nonprofit uh, collaborations that are focused on longevity as well. So, and I look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Hey, um, Safa. Hi, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm Safa Raishchi. I am the founder and managing partner of Think Plus Ventures. We are an early stage fund here in Silicon Valley based in Palo Alto. Um, before starting uh, Think Plus Ventures, I was an angel investor, invested in 30 companies, had seven exits sold to public companies. And before that, I was an analyst on Wall Street. Our fund is somewhat differentiated from other early stage funds in that it is uh, a thesis based and market driven rather than just being founder focused. We of course take great care in selecting the best visionary founders, but we start with a major pain point that we identify in the market that we have a thesis around and then we look for founders and products that match that problem. Uh, we just finished our uh, first fund and that's up two and a half, three X and less than two and a half years. We are raising our second fund, which is a $30 million fund. We do focus a lot on digital health because we have identified it as a macro level major pain point that has uh, probably about a 10 to 20 year path um, ahead of it. Uh, so that's a big focus for us. And um, as such, I'm really happy to be here and see some great companies. Nice, nice. Brian McMahon, please introduce yourself. Yes, great to be here. Um, lovely to be joining all of this, uh, the, these wonderful people on the panel. We're an early stage fund here in Santa Monica in California. We invest in approximately one company per week right now. Uh, we take companies at the earliest stage. Uh, we, we fit the classical place of an accelerator with a few differences. And uh, number one, 90% of our companies are international that we find. So we invest a lot in India. Uh, we invest a lot in the MENA region that we consider to be very exciting right now. We invest a little bit in Europe and a little bit in the UK, a lot in Latin America, and we like Canada as well. Um, and really, we just have a, a favoritism mm -hmm. towards either immigrant founders or international founders. Uh, we do early checks, $100,000 into companies, and we'll follow on with million dollar checks afterwards. Now, we don't have a fund. We don't want a fund, really. <laughs> it seems like a lot of trouble. It's just myself and my partner. So, and we'll invest in about 100 companies next year. Thank you, Paul. Wow, 100 companies. That beats me. Yeah. So I'm tired, I'm tired the, already. <laughs> hey, that's awesome. That's great. Uh, so uh, I'm here at IndieBio in San Francisco. Uh, you see people behind me because we have uh, Casper, which is a CRISPR-based assay company developing it. Our labs are downstairs. We don't know. If we were one of the first VC firms to actually put labs in our building. Um, so I'm a general partner at SOSV, which runs accelerators around the world. Uh, IndieBio is now in San Francisco and in New York. Uh, through IndieBio, we accelerate uh, about 40 companies a year now. We have uh, graduated so far 136 companies over the last five years across human and planetary health. And uh, as for our sort of specific orientation or bias or variant perception around longevity, I'd recommend everyone look at Decoding the World. You can probably go read the longevity chapter for free on Amazon. Uh, you can certainly read lots of free chapters there. but um, 
we have learned a lot from doing lots of companies and being able to work with the companies in our labs that uh, affects how we perceive these things. Thank you very much, Lozan. You're just in time. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Please Hi, introduce everyone. Yourself. Hi, yeah. Julia. Sorry for being late. It's OK. Must we just started. Yeah. So. Uh, you mean the panel started or we just started? Yeah, the panel just started and now everyone already introduced uh, uh, themselves okay. and please, uh, now your turn, please introduce right. yourself. So I'm Lu, I'm the founding uh, and managing partner of Fusion Fund. We're a Silicon Valley based, Palo Alto based uh, VC firm, mainly focused on deep tech and healthcare investment. And I started Fusion Fund back in 2015, uh, five years ago. So far we have three fund under management, RSI, Average fund size is roughly $100 million, and we see the pre-series A stage. Prefer to lead and also OK to co-invest. So far, we have over 60 portfolio companies across the United States, and we also uh, are growing our team in the past couple of years. So for me, my previous background, as a, uh, I was more on the entrepreneur side. So I was, uh, I was running my own medical device company called uh, Ascento, focused on type 2 diabetes, early stage diagnostic. I ran it for a couple of years. I started when I was a student at the Stanford University with an academia background of material science engineering, so deep tech background. So after I sold my company to Boston Scientific a couple of years later, that's when I started to do investment. I was trying to support my fellow founders and later found out, you know, investment is also a very interesting job. That's the reason I, after joining a larger VC firm as a partner, I left there and I started Fusion Fund back in 2015. Thank you. Impressive. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Mm, it was so nice to get uh, more information about your experience and background. Thanks uh, for sharing with us. And um, uh, first question to you will be about uh, what is the driving force behind VCs uh, for impact investment in health tech, wellness, longevity tech industries? Very often, uh, venture investors are looking for elaborate technologies in pursuing the next unicorn, and uh, they uh, often don't do proper due diligence in sustainability and impact for their value proposition. Uh, and maybe in health tech, wellness, longevity tech, those uh, that may not be the case. And um, how do you think what uh, is doing force uh, for investors in impact health tech, biotech, longevity tech companies? Who would like to start? I'll take a crack at it. So broadly speaking, um, many, many family offices around the world that are themselves LPs into lots of funds or, or have their own fund. Uh, they often have a general interest in health that, but it's more commonly a poignant and very, very personal interest because of a beloved one. It could have been uh, generations before, or it could be a child today in their family, in their relatives network, who is suffering from a disease and they have a lot of interest in that disease itself. And so the challenge from organized impact investing, especially like at the bank level with a lot of the high net worth, ultra high net worth families that are organized is sort of matching the investor to the startup. That's actually a, kind of a significant challenge because Julia, as you said, they could go on Facebook and they could look for what companies are doing something in any one space, who's solving this particular thing. And uh, they wouldn't have any way to diligence it. And they don't really know quite how to price it. And they don't have the benefit of sort of professional investors at the same time. I think longevity comes into this in a way to help try to treat something that we're all dealing with and treat something across the board. It attracts people's interest because it gets them out of that sort of single disease state type of investing. The, one of the big challenges is uh, from a portfolio strategy as well, is that when you're doing impact investing into health and if you start getting into a specific disease, you can get overweighted very easily and you can sort of not have balancing mechanisms in your portfolio to make sure one risk isn't, isn't offset by others. So um, 
we work with a lot of uh, other trying to move our companies along with a lot of impact investors in healthcare. And these are some of the challenges that we see, which is really just trying to give them some confidence uh, to replace that diligence and, you know, orchestrating that kind of confident feeling about what they're doing. And then lastly, I would say just a lot of impact investing took interest in COVID in the last eight months. Um, and we didn't see a lot of movement, but we saw some towards COVID. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can add in a comment as well. Yeah, of course, I was uh, going to ask you, Brian, because as far as I know, uh, previously you invested in early stage tech uh, startups from any industry. Um, yeah. So we started general, and I think, look, from a, a VC perspective, we all try and do due diligence. Sometimes, you know, there's we have Theranos disasters, and sometimes we have really great outcomes, but everybody tries to do diligence, and, and then there are, are characteristics and things brought in, such as the emotion of what's actually being done. And now we started off being generalist, and we wanted just to find the greatest founders around the world and then provide a bridge into the into America. We saw that there was a gap in the market there, and we started working on that. And then we just started coming across some really wonderful things that were being done in the world. And, and every VC is going to approach this from the perspective of we have to provide value to our shareholders, even if it's ourselves or if it's outside LPs. Like that's the principal objective of a VC. However, if value can be provided to shareholders while at the same time providing just really good in the world, it would be great. So, you know, longevity and diagnostics and all of them in some stage, they blur into one place, right? Because if things aren't diagnosed properly at the beginning, then they don't live very long. And um, so we had a company that came to us at Yale that had a patent in, um, in Duke, and they were looking to provide a diagnostic tool that would reduce the cost of sickle cell diagnosis by 90 to 95%. So for us, we know like 250,000 kids a year die in Africa because of that. So it's kind of a no brainer. So if we just look now, if we can find a company where we have domain expertise within the people that are around us, whereby we can see it solving a huge problem, we can see that the market is good enough, we can see that maybe the diagnostic tool can move further, we'll go there. I mean, I will say we also love the, um, the genome space as well. We have two companies that are directly in genomics, both have raised like 30 to $50 million. Mm -hmm. I understand. And uh, Lujan, could you please also uh, give uh, the answer from your perspective? Uh, your yeah, point? happy to. I think uh, especially, you know, this uh, discussion for impact investment has been a very popular topic. Last year I was in a web summit when we'll still be able to travel, I remember, because it's in Europe. So lots of the question is uh, on panel to me is regarding how to really make sure we could do impact investment and also typical you know, financial result driven investment together. I think healthcare is a very good overlap for achieving both goals. Because one thing I really want to push back is sometimes people think, oh, do you need to sacrifice your financial return in order to have an impact of your investment, which is not sustainable. The best scenario will be we were able to generate sustainable you know, very good financial return, but meanwhile, investing in good technology has a positive impact over the society. So healthcare definitely is a very, very good industry. The reason I been focused on healthcare initially is because I was running my own medical device company for diagnostic. As uh, Brian mentioned, you know, diagnostic go along with longevity. And now with COVID-19, this is a very strong push for people really allocate capital to healthcare in general. And furthermore, because of the concern on the mental health, now there's more, more kind of capital resources allocated to mental well-being or wellness in general. So I think this is all the good trend happening right now. And another thing I think besides we talk about, you know, like family office capital, another driving power is really the integration of the new technology with the traditional healthcare sector or even longevity sector. Because we used to be, it's really hard to do continuously monitoring our continuous diagnostic in order to provide personalized result for us to achieve the goal, no matter for diagnostic or longevity. But now with no matter AI, artificial, AI, machine learning, or even, you know, edge compute, we were able to really power by the technology to push the digital transformation for the whole healthcare industry. And the technology make it possible, then definitely gonna attract more capital to back this uh, direction for further investment in the near future. Yeah, you're right. In uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020, we see uh, uh, rapid increases uh, in investing into well-being and uh, care delivery companies. 
Uh, yeah, it's very good. Uh, Kate, maybe you could uh, also answer. I can try, of course. Uh, I... Yeah, you found this. Happy to, yes. I'm happy to add my two cents and the excellent points were already made by my uh, colleagues. Uh, in terms of impact investment, that has been very much our focus for uh, over five years within our group. We really think that uh, aging uh, presents a huge socioeconomic uh, burden to the society. It, you know, as uh, Paul mentioned, it does affect everyone. Uh, we also observed that uh, COVID-19 era, if anything, uh, refocused on human health and many traditional investors who let's say focus on such uh, sectors as real estate and tourism and all that they now actually are redirecting towards uh, human health uh, we like the lo uh, logan that uh, health is the new wealth uh, aging itself is a cause of uh, many chronic diseases and um, uh, lastly i will also add that uh, our focus in terms of investing in longevity is perhaps slightly different from many uh, funds that are focusing on biomedicine only, because we believe there's a lot that can be done uh, today that does not necessarily depend on clinical trials. And such sectors in involve, uh, you know, for instance, uh, age tech, uh, because uh, there are companies there now, we have older people living uh, uh, now, it's actually 1 billion of them globally. And uh, it has to do with improving lives of currently living older people. So that's a sector that you know is important. Uh, we are also uh, big believers uh, in preventive medicine and precision medicine, especially applying AI to uh, precision medicine data coming not only from older and sicker people, but younger and healthier. And then uh, also we like the uh, FinTech sector uh, as it applies to longevity. And I can elaborate on that later on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and Stefan. Yeah, thanks. Uh, these are great areas and great uh, uh, insights. Uh, so I really enjoyed listening to it. Uh, our approach to impact investing within healthcare is a little bit different. It might not be very uh, sexy or appealing, but uh, to me, uh, especially as we look at U.S. or other uh, develop or, or developing economies, especially. Uh, the biggest impact is to enable those who are disenfranchised, those who are disadvantaged, to have access to health care, to be able to uh, have knowledge about their own health care, to, to know how to uh, communicate uh, their problems. Uh, I see this a lot in this country. Uh, one of the problems that uh, one of the um, uh, kind of startup ideas that actually we put forward to Stanford team the other day was to come up with a platform that you can engage these people, not necessarily just to provide the healthcare services for them directly, but to engage them in their own healthcare to make them knowledgeable about what to look for, where to look for different uh, uh, healthcare options. Uh, we think that that actually will have the largest single impact in, on, a, on a societal and global level when we can bring in everybody here. If you look at the US, for instance, uh, we have many, many problems with our healthcare. By all accounts, it's the most inefficient, one of the most inefficient healthcare systems in the world in terms of how much we spend as opposed to what we get at a societal level in terms of life uh, expectancy and other factors. However, for people like us, we enjoy the best healthcare. I don't have any problem with my healthcare in this country, uh, but my housekeeper is not the same. They have lots of problems. They're not knowledgeable about, about when to seek help. They, not, they don't know where to go to. Even when they have insurance, they don't really have enough, inter enough confidence and interaction with their healthcare provider to stay healthy. And I think that is the most important uh, area where we really can get a double benefit of both doing good for the society as well as taking care of the entire healthcare system by lowering the cost. So we look into those inclusion platforms, we look into where we can make an impact in disadvantaged uh, demographics um, and uh, make bring them into the fold of having good health care. Yes, so as we see a lot of investors see these benefits uh, and uh, according to Silicon Valley Bank uh, in uh, 2019 uh, investment in health tech were uh, 7.4 billion US dollars and it will rise uh, in 2020. So yeah, venture investors are interested in this uh, area and uh, um, this can also show us uh, some trends and uh, uh, let's discuss uh, which trends do you see in this industry. And uh, 
best opportunities for investment. And uh, maybe you can give your, some examples of uh, successful cases, the most successful, as you know. Who would like to share your... Well, I, I'm, I'm always ready to talk, but I want to give someone else a chance. Yeah, well, please talk. Go ahead and start, Bo. Okay, we'll okay. It. I, I, look, it's important to understand that, like, Investors shouldn't all have the same perception. We should have our own perceptions and we have to believe in our perceptions. So at IndieBio, we believe that the body is kind of like a game of telephone. And in the old game of telephone, one person says something to the next and the next person says something to the next, the next person says something to the next. And at the end of that game of telephone are what's called vital signs. Vital signs are only good at measuring whether you're alive or dead. They are not big data. They aren't the beginning of the game of telephone. Our fundamental thesis is that we need to measure the data around the way that cells talk to themselves and talk to other cells. And we need, and the way that the body is actually communicating to itself, we need to measure that rather than measuring way downstream at the other end of the game of telephone. I believe the industry is getting much closer now, but it's not quite there. So for example, uh, where we're me measuring messenger RNA, we ought to be measuring microRNAs. If we're not we're measuring microRNAs, we shouldn't be using the traditional MER base with 2,800 MERs. We'd be still looking at MER isoforms. Once you're getting into MER isoforms, now you're actually communicating at the and listening at the beginning of the game of telephone. In a similar way, if we're measuring exosome signaling, we should actually be measuring what's in the payload of exosomes and what are those exosome signaling proteins doing on the outside. 10 years ago, we thought this was cellular garbage, but it's actually how cells communicate at a distance. Uh, in, in, so I, you know, we have companies, an example, we think that multiomics is a very, very strong and powerful field. And for us, the key challenge there is to get multi-omics down in cost to what Safa was saying, like it's bringing this down so it's an annualized test. So how do we do it better? So we have a company, Dalton, out of UCLA that uses in a single pass of a mass spec, they can do thousands of biomarkers because they're basically fragging all, all everything in your blood running it through a mass spec and then rebuilding it in the computer. So thousands of biomarkers at for only a couple hundred bucks. That starts to bring multi-omics to the masses. That's just one example. In liquid biopsy, obviously grails out there. We believe that there is a much better ways to do that. If anyone saw Rob Knight's paper in Nature back in March by measuring microbial uh, NGS of what's going on, you can actually read tumors way before they're there, better than measuring sort of the tumor itself in its NGS. So it's all about to us finding the diagnostics that power early intervention into people's disease state. So we can capture yeah. things early, we dramatically lower their cost. So I feel like the industry is close, but isn't quite there. And I'm not a believer, I would actively say, I think, you know, because we have a variant perception that measuring all this rough big data at the end of the game of telephone is not going to tell you what's really going on. That's our, that's our approach. Yeah, by the way, measurement is ultimate by hack. It's just a basis of uh, health optimization. And uh, we here in Biohacking Congress, so we see a lot of innovation technologies where both platforms are dedicated to measurement and uh, uh, they measure, they help to keep your data, uh, they have to check your uh, benchmarks. A lot of innovations, at least uh, several devices and at least uh, several platforms so we saw uh, just uh, they started uh, just started to build the startups and uh, several of them will be at our biohacking congress in silicon valley levels health uh, yeah so um, hands up big platforms startups so really i see um, a lot of new startups in this area Oh. And uh, one thing I do want to echo, Paul, is, you know, the, the importance of uh, having the device, you know, the hardware software integration side, because I was in a panel early this year at the JP Morgan House Conference, 
And I remember there's other uh, fellow investor on my panel, they tried to persuade a founder only go with purely software solution with no hardware and then bypass FDA directly go to consumer. I'm like, no, because maybe because of my background, you know, I no matter hardware background or medical device background, device part is very important. On one side, you know, we need a medical device to do very precise uh, measurement. And then we utilize the data to do personalization, but you need to have a foundation. Another thing is, you know, when we talk about digitalization, you know, it's not about software eating out the world. It's about software hardware integration because the entrance of data is hardware. It's a medical device, it's sensor. You need to have this integration in order to make sure the result company provided are accurate enough. I mean, well, could be really accepted by the existing healthcare system and also could be able to go through FDA to get approval. I really, really want to encourage all the funder don't bypass, especially digital health, don't bypass FDA. Get FDA approval will be, will be a very big plus to the company and also it's critical. And besides that, another thing related to AI in healthcare, because AI in healthcare is such a trend that not everyone talk about it. Although back in 2017, when I was promoted in JP Morgan, like most of the people still want to stay away from healthcare. But AI definitely could show the full capability in healthcare system because healthcare has a huge amount of high quality data. But on the other side, I think the important part is uh, which type of application uh, we want to invest, our funders should build is, is really, really make sure the solution is empower existing player rather than replacement. Because we saw company came in saying that, okay, we're gonna have this solution, replace nurse, replace doctor. Somehow it won't work. Like we have lots of company, what they're doing is, for example, they have this uh, maybe purely software solution. One company called Sado Medical, they recently closed an oversubscribed series A round. They raised around summertime this year during COVID-19 still got multiple term shit. Because their solution is a software sit on top of CT scan, PET scan, and MRI scan. And uh, if, the, for example, you run the uh, CT scan with low resolution, the software could upgrade it to high resolution. So it's a very good integration between the startup application with the traditional medical devices. And they were able mm -hmm. to get FDA approval, two FDA approval within one year. So this is the type of empowerment argument we're talking about for AI in healthcare solution. And another thing I want to quickly tackle is really related to the data. As I mentioned, you know, healthcare has huge amount of high quality data, but not necessarily most of them are structured well, ready to be used by no matter AI, you know, edge computer, all this new technology. So I think another trend we found very interesting is uh, no matter company, our solution be able to structuralize the data to empower all this healthcare system provider to provide their data to some company to use it, no matter to small startup company or even for insurance company. The last one is actually the one I mentioned earlier in the first uh, discussion point topic is the mental health. I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, I'm a very interested in mental disease, no matter diagnostic, we even have several therapeutic company focused on, you know, dementia, no matter diagnostic treatment. I think we have, we know so little about mental disease for the past, like I would say centuries. And uh, now finally we have the technology available for us to do co continuous monitoring and also be able to find a correlation between the mental disease and also other symptoms of our body. So I think that's a very interesting trend, especially now with COVID-19 related to that is also mental well-being, like depression problem and other mental problem. So I think that's another very interesting trend, big challenge, but also big opportunity for us to watch. Yeah, interesting. We are talking a lot about that data and uh, let's remind uh, all these talks about security of personal data. What do you think about this? I think the question of um, how we can make use of data is very important uh, because I think Paul mentioned that um, we just sometimes think that if we gather the data, we'll end up someplace. And this is not just in healthcare. I, I see this uh, in many other industries. I've had uh, dozens and dozens of um, entrepreneurs pitch me and saying, this is our model, we'll do this, we'll do this marketplace. And by the way, our real gold mine is that we'll gather this data and we'll make use of it. I actually want to put forward something which may be, um, if not controversial, not, not very popular, which is data is overrated. Uh, we do need data and we can make use of it, but over the past 20 years or so that I have been observing uh, data collection in various places, invariably uh, the potential use of data has been far below what was initially expected. It doesn't mean we shouldn't go after data. I, I'm just saying we have to have our expectations more realistic about how useful the data can be. And also, especially in healthcare, 
can we find patterns within data uh, just to have the data collected, let's say from blood samples. We had a company recently pitch us on COVID-19 and they were able to detect some patterns of COVID in blood samples and they were, they actually had a lot more data from it. So they had signed up number of deals and they had, uh, I don't know, millions of data points in there. But to be able to actually make uh, actionable and impactful decisions from that data will take years and years. Uh, so that's one point I want to make that it is great to collect the data, but as we saw, for instance, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, fitness devices, uh, initially when Fitbit came in, everybody was excited. We have to measure everything. Then they realized that just by measuring, you don't really get anywhere. Uh, but now gradually we're, we're seeing the collection of all this data, even though some of them are low quality, but when you put them all together, you can make some sense of it and you can actually correlate them with some pattern. But we're still in the beginning of it. I would say five years from now, we'll be able to have much more useful conclusion from the devices that we wear like Fitbit and other ones uh, about the data that we collect. And I think the same thing applies to much deeper cellular level data that we can get, that we will need a lot more time to make sense of those things. And those are to me kind of good long shots which we should definitely focus on and invest in. Uh, but those I put in a category of um, um, areas that uh, will need long investment horizons, long research periods, uh, and potentially will have really uh, uh, revolutionary impact uh, like imaging, AI and imaging and other areas uh, uh, or different uh, biomes. Uh, on the other side of it, there is some more practical applications that are fairly easy to use. You could almost call them the low hanging fruit, remote patient monitoring, uh, connecting patients with, uh, uh, with their own data, giving, empowering them to take actions on their data. Some of these things are easily doable and are fairly impactful. Uh, the only uh, hurdle for them is really acceptance by institutions, reimbursements, and a few regulatory issues. So, uh, at Think Plus, we try to kind of have a dumbbell uh, approach. We focus both on the uh, more futuristic, uh, more research-driven approaches. We have a couple of uh, genomics companies we have invested in. I just uh, had a call with an um, aging company that has really very, very interesting, deep technology and a new approach uh, for treating aging. But we also focus on areas where we actually can have impact and potentially profit right now which is uh, more easily doable right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Julia, I gotta, I'll throw in a point or two, if you don't mind. Uh, so fascinating, interesting. I know Dalton, that's a, it's a great company, Po. Um, and so just some, just some, I, I really enjoy this panel actually, because it's, yes, it's about finance and yes, we have to get returns, but, but we're really a small part of trying to save the world in our own little way. And that's a really beautiful thing. Um, and I also think what Lou said about depression is very sure. I think if COVID didn't get us, then the election probably got us in the last week or two. So it's been a, it's definitely been a tough year and we'll come out of it a different way. Um, my, my, my thesis or my thoughts really are that VCs don't really have a thesis. We just have, we just have bias, which has been built up over years. And that bias is not always a negative bias. A lot of the time it's a positive bias. If we see something being done a certain amount of times, and that's why it's a little bit like trying to tell our kids that, you know, when they grow up in life, things will be a lot easier because the experience will culminate. And based on that, we'll just make better decisions. And so will they. And, and I think within VC, it's very much the same. You know, we, we started Expert Dojo really as an accidental fund. It was because I just couldn't quite understand why there was a 98% failure in startup and why it was okay. I'm, I'm not worried about what makes unicorns because there's a perfectly contrived and manipulated system to create unicorns. It was more about what causes the problem in startups in the first place of why so many startups actually fail. And then we invested in our first 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 companies. And then we started to get hit with a bunch of folks in the healthcare space. And I always remember one of the first ones, it was a, it was a TB company and she was based over in India and just a genius uh, with a phenomenal team around her. And, and just tuberculosis for me, is just, it's just a stupid disease. It just shouldn't exist. And the fact that it exists is not because we can't find a cure for it, not because we can't build algorithms to deal with the mutations of it so that we can go in between the different um, solutions that we have. It's just because it's a poor disease that's been let go. It's the same as sickle cell. It shouldn't exist. Like the fact that 250,000 children beneath the age of five die 
every single year in Africa simply because they are not diagnosed is just stupid. Um, in mass spectrometry is another phenomenal space. Like we have a company that we invested in, in the mass spec space who are putting together a center of innovation for mass spec because their belief is just drug development. I mean, very much like Dalton in, in their own way as well. They believe that drug development is just, is just stupid. Like it shouldn't cost $4 billion in 12 years to develop one drug. Like, like what part of any of this is okay? And then we took another company over in Belarus uh, who are a pathology company, a robot pathology company. And their view was that it's just silly that we're just only 2% or 3% of the population get to even have serious tr um, treatments like cancer done properly. It's almost like cancer is a disease for the wealthy and not for anybody else around. So they've created artificial intelligence and machine learning that's now been deployed in a number of hospitals in Europe, which will actually allow us to be able to get second opinions with pathology tests. My, my point to this whole thing is we, we actually were looking for a name for the fund because we ended up having 50% of our companies and um, being in the, uh, the med tech space or the healthcare space. And we just decided to call it the stupid fund because it's just all silly. Like this, this stuff that exists in the world doesn't need to exist. And the lovely thing about it is from a venture capitalist perspective is we can make money and it's okay to make money. It's actually good to make money. We should be able to bring these things and bring them out to the world. So my, my thesis, we'll call it, has kind of shifted to a place of, do I see a phenomenal entrepreneur? Does that entrepreneur um, showcase the ability to execute based on what they've done previously? Do we have an indication that I can measure on math rather than you know future rather than having to be a futurist and if we see that and then if we can add in there that it can do tremendous good in the world and it fits into our stupid scale then i'm happy as a camper uh, so the most uh, startups uh, in which you invest uh, they leverage artificial intelligence uh, internet of things and machine learning to enable their products and solutions uh, correct so most of them have ai for me, yeah. So we, yeah, so we have a med tech. I mean, our, our our sickle cell company is a med is a medical device, uh, which is coming out of Yale. And the mass spectrometry will be about fifteen mass spec devices, uh, which will all be centered over in Boston. Um, the live that's uh, live veritas. Um, we have a, a, a another company that's artificial intelligence out of Israel that deal with them um, uh, preterm. Like preterm is another very silly thing. Like why should ten percent of women have preterm, it's just ridiculous. So yeah, virtually all of them are either a device or they are, you know, are some kind of smart stuff built into things that require it. And if, if we are talking about software and hardware startups, uh, which would you prefer? So I mean, uh, do you have some uh, special preferences for hardware startups or for software startups in this area? So I, I always remember, sorry, very quick, I'll just add this, because I always remember the very first company, one of the first companies um, that we did a very small investment into was a scooter company many years ago, just to go off topic. And that's just because everybody should have a failed scooter company, or you're not a proper VC. Uh, and then suddenly we had four, I don't know, huge, big, uh, uh, almost a football field of scooters. And our problem wasn't like, how do we write off the money? Or how do we, it's just like, what the hell do we do a football field of scooters? So look, as a not thinking as a VC, I love hardware devices because they're required. Like you can't have the software without the hardware. Somebody has to do the heavy lifting and you can't pass that to someone else. And these devices do tremendous amount of good, especially in med tech. And um, if I'm not left with a football field of devices after something goes wrong, I do feel better as well. I understand. And, uh, uh, if I may add uh, a couple of points and uh, thank you everyone for sharing your views. I uh, agree very much. Uh, in terms of uh, our investment thesis, uh, it relies very much on our definition of longevity industry. Actually, there is a, a book that we released recently that's called Longevity Industry 1.0 and summaries and open access. But basically, because we define longevity industry uh, beyond biomedicine and include, let's say, P4 medicine there, as well as HTAC and longevity financial industry, uh, that kind of affects how we invest. Uh, granted, we were the city investors in, in silicon medicine, which is uh, AI for drug discovery. They also work on biomarkers of longevity and a number of other exciting things. Uh, but uh, we're also interested in, in the other sectors as well, especially uh, something that is very ready to go to market. Uh, like HTAC is one of the examples. 
another thing is um, we, during the summer of 2020, we became seed investors in uh, longevity card because essentially what it does, it, uh, you know, it's an intersection of FinTech, longevity, health tech, when a card holder, regardless of their age, person who cares about health and financial stability going forward, uh, essentially uh, enters a certain of their daily activities and encrypted health da data, if they so wish. And based on that, they get uh, personalized health and fin financial tips, as well as access to longevity marketplace on a discount basis. That's one of the examples. And then lastly, with respect to newer tech, we're also big believers in that space. Uh, we've prepared uh, an open access analytical report. We can go to neurotech.com. There's actually, um, uh, so it's a landscape overview of everyone in this space. And again, it's open access. Uh, there is a great conference coming up at the end of the month uh, devoted to that topic. So for everyone who focuses on this field, I highly encourage uh, attending this virtual event. Thank you very much. I'll add uh, just to Brian's point. For us, probably two out of three uh, of our company, they have to have two out of three between AI hardware and bio. Like um, we do have uh, there are some exceptions, but I completely agree that hardware is often a very necessary step to get at measuring something that isn't isn't there. Software modeling, but we like, we only have one pure software company, uh, 1063, which is a drug design company. Um, but even then, they're building want to build hardware for sort of high throughput chemistry on the back end. So, like in some way, like uh, I would say, you know, the robotics for high throughput, at the very least, at, on the hardware side, um, if for these yeah. systems to make it work. Yeah, do you hardware know, is not from a consumer perspective, and uh, you know, a lot of testimonials from biohacker that uh, uh, hardware devices uh, and. Uh, Variable devices allow us to get a much more better quality of uh, benchmarks than uh, if we will use uh, just usual like phone, iPhone, which can measure something. <laughs> yeah, so devices still is very necessary. Yeah, Lou, you want? I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Oh no, it's fine. No, I was going to just uh, say a couple of words on hardware and the software aspect of it. And I, I, do I do agree that they're both necessary, but uh, from an investment point of view as a VC, to me, hardware is a lot less defensible uh, because um, it, it just can be duplicated a lot easier, easily compared to software. Uh, one of our companies, for instance, uh, Spry Health, uh, has a wearable. Uh, it is the hardware, but their really core technology is in the algorithms of what they do after they measure. Otherwise, it's just a fancy Fitbit uh, because it can really be done much faster and cheaper, let's say in China or other places. Uh, so yes, hardware is necessary for the whole platform, but I think you can really build an IP just on the software part. Even that is becoming more difficult these days, but I think to build an IP on the hardware is far more difficult than to do it on software. Yeah, absolutely, you are right. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, my next question about uh, this market, which is uh, crowded, because we see uh, investment rise and uh, we see health uh, startups booming and a lot of IPOs. And uh, the market started to be more crowded. So, uh, and uh, startups face um, uh, these new challenges uh, at this crowded market. Uh, so, how do you think what uh, health tech entrepreneurs should consider uh, to become successful at this crowded market? So, what uh, competitive ad advantages uh, they should uh, consider uh, to become successful? Here now. differentiation is like differentiation you've got to differentiate and so i think that's the most important thing like like <laughs> brian was just talking about every vc has to have you know a, a scooter company right and he's right and like right now every every vc needs to have sort of a 
uh, protein degrader ProTac company in their portfolio, right? And uh, everybody's got to have uh, a fertility company in their portfolio, right? Like, um, and and that's okay. It's just they need to be different. Uh, and sometimes it overlaps. So, uh, like an example is, let's say you're doing nucleic acid medicines, and it's like, okay, there's a lot of nucleic medicine nucleic acid medicine types of approaches from ASOs and CERNAs and all this stuff. What, what is nobody doing there? Mitochondria, nucleic acid medicines to the mitochondria, nobody's doing. So you can do that, even though you can do all the other cells too, you can at least be first look is, oh, wow, nobody's doing that. I think that's a strong first impression. There are a lot of devices to recharge mitochondria. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> and no, <laughs> red light therapy. And well, a lot of people are doing stuff on mitochondria, but not, not necessarily at a nucleic acid level, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of stuff in longevity is focused on mitochondria for sure. Yes. Uh, but so, I mean, it just like differentiation, I would say, is no, most important to mm -hmm. avoid the crowd. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, to add on to that, I think definitely, you know, if I definitely agree with Paul that for something different, you know, differentiation is critical for competitive advantage. But if you found, okay, this is something others already do, then just uh, simply do it faster, cheaper, and better. So, you know, I see better, faster. Faster means uh, like operation and execution need to be faster and the cheaper, like cheaper is very important. And the, Beyond that, another important thing is easy to integrate. You know, especially in Silicon Valley, you know, I met lots of uh, technical founders, especially healthcare founders, they have a, such a fancy solution. And when they try to integrate a solution with the customer, they kind of expect that their customer gonna have a 4.0 upgraded infrastructure to integrate their fancy solution, which won't happen. So they need to really think to provide a solution could easily integrate with their existing customer infrastructure and then probably upgrade from there together with their potential customer. So I think integration is another important part, add on to like cheaper, faster and uh, better. And meanwhile, another thing I think is very, very important is trying to find the strong partnerships uh, because now, as you said, you know, it's a super crowded market and uh, there's uh, so many different solutions, good founders and uh, it's hard for founder just to bypass any existing player, try to replace them, then become the number one. So leverage the partnership is very important. Do we have a couple of companies, they have a team of 12, team of seven, they were able to get contract from Pfizer and other artists uh, range from a couple million to 20 million. Then they will be able to run faster compared with other competitor. Not necessarily means their solution technology is better. It just, uh, you know, leverage the partnership, they will be able to leverage their customers' distribution channel rather than build it themselves. So I think that's another thing for, for reference for founder. Yeah, and I think uh, here we also can mention that uh, they should give right value proposition and uh, try to collaborate with uh, existing healthcare and uh, clinical models uh, because uh, they shouldn't replace uh, medical doctors and uh, existing uh, healthcare. They should uh, provide some some additional to this uh, healthcare. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I'll add one extra point because the thing about this is there's no right answer. It's the culmination of all of these answers. What Lou said there about partnerships is vital. Like, like it's mm -hmm. about, I always remember a great entrepreneur said to me years ago, I have the very best product. I know you said, I know three things. I have the very best product on the market. I have the least expensive product on the market. And in 12 months time, somebody else will have the best and least expensive product on mm -hmm. the market. So it's about fast scaling and making sure you get there. But what I'd love to add on top of the differentiation and the partnership and the integration is the brand. And it's one of the things that actually saddens me most about what's happened in the last 10 or 15 years. Without question, Air America was the greatest storytelling nation on the planet, bar nobody. That's what we did best. And over the last five or 10 years, and I don't want to blame Lean Startup, but I, I do want to blame the interpretation of Lean Startup, is that there's this feeling now that we just need to get product out to market as quickly as we possibly can. And we need to start getting customer reaction to that product. And we kind of bypass that beautiful piece at the beginning, which is creating this really beautiful story about how it affects. So like e even if you take the sickle cell device that I was talking about, even the founder, when they were speaking to me, they were so deep on the detail of the features of the product. I'm like, I don't 
care. Like nobody, no consumer cares about the feature of your product. They just care about the little face of the little girl who's in Africa, who's about to die because she hasn't been diagnosed because it costs $62 to get diagnosed for sickle cell and her mom and dad are not going to be able to afford it. Like, so I think we need to get back to a place of where entrepreneurs really try and discover what that why is, what that really deep feeling is. And they get that out because that that part of healthcare is really everything. Like our health is what makes us live it, what makes us be here. And people need to touch that again. Well, Brian, they won't get there unless investors like us uh, actually encourage and reward that kind of thinking, which we don't. We, we are looking for a product that can go to market in 12 months and can scale fast and it's easy for adoption. And uh, as you were talking about, uh, you know, what will make it work? What I've seen is that the, a product that's nice to have does have a chance, but it's very, very hard. Long say cycle, long cycles. You have. But to have I, a I don't mean is- I don't mean a bad product. I mean a great product where just the founder can get the story to the consumers. If they get the story to the consumers, then the consumers will love them. Yeah. They build loyal fans. They bypass yeah. like our model of hey, just get Facebook ads and like buy a bunch of stuff, and then people will come in. It just it brings that deep loyal um, force that would be with them. But your point is still valid. <laughs> yeah, here's a question. Uh, usually we see us waiting for the return uh, during one, two years. So is it the same in this uh, industry? Because uh, uh, here is a uh, um, trial period much more longer and uh, uh, customer don't pay uh, exactly to start up maybe should be through uh, insurance companies, through clinics, if they collaborate together. So is here in this industry the same situation that we see is waiting for returns during next one, two years or longer period? How it is? Was that to me or somebody else? Uh, Safa was talking about <laughs> that yeah. uh, he's looking for <laughs> products uh, which will give return in one year. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm not necessarily looking for it. I just tell our uh, entrepreneurs, be prepared for it. Uh, I, sometimes I love products that uh, um, um, might take more than a year to sell, actually. Uh, but I would only invest if I know that the company has enough funding to go through the sales cycle. Uh, I recently had a call with um, a company that had invet- invented um, um, a new uh, device to, to be used in operating rooms. And just as we all said, it was clearly the best, it was a lower cost and it performed better than the other devices. Uh, but still for this entrepreneur to convince the doctors to switch was a pretty long task. And uh, while he was having some success, uh, it really wasn't turning over the way that you would expect. And this is not atypical because just like many other industries, the doctors are used to operating like this. Unless it is a major pain point that they deal with every day, they rather have that 10% failure that they know about than start something new. And they don't even have time to try it. So uh, if you have something that really is revolutionary, but it will take a long time to sell, that's great. But you have to raise enough money. You have to deal with the right kind of investors who say, look, I'm going to invest in not just 1 million, but 5 million. And I know that this will take about three years to come to fruition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kate, also a question to you. Uh, at this crowded market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, competitive well, advantages is very important. For sure. I think it is extremely important to avoid general pessimism about longevity. So this is why we focus, uh, you know, not on just, uh, you know, biomedical sectors. Uh, we think that... Uh, uh, overestimation of positive uh, results in preclinical trials in model organisms uh, actually later results in uh, uh, in failure of the companies, and we've seen a couple of big flops this year, as I'm sure you've heard. So, uh, and our concern is that by association, let's say non uh, biomedical sectors of longevity uh, industry can, you know, fall under this umbrella of negativity. So it's very important to, as, as mentioned, to diversify. 
uh, as well as uh, you know fo focus on some you know sectors that I that I've uh, mentioned. And uh, in terms of biomedicine, there was a great article in Nature earlier this year, uh, which made a suggestion that instead of humanizing uh, model organism uh, models, uh, it's more important it's it's more important to humanize. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, computational models derived from uh, animal experiments. So that's uh, a couple of points that I have to say. Mm -hmm. Good, good. I was curious about regulatory challenges for biotech uh, startups, and maybe Paul can uh, just a little bit tell us from his perspective, because it's also some of the biggest challenges. Uh, yeah, well, I. Uh, kind of, you know, as others said earlier, you know, seeking regulatory approval, helping to create a moat around your company can be extremely valuable. We definitely have uh, advanced a number of technologies that could kind of go either way. And I will say this, if you are on the fence, or you could kind of go either way, whether you're going to seek regulation or to not go towards it, you are in trouble. Mm -hmm. You cannot be both. <laughs> this yeah. You can be one now and the other later very clearly, but you will really confuse investors because what Safa said, there are a lot of you know consumer investors and they want to know you are in fact going to market. Not like, but maybe we could be a therapeutic. Like that causes all sorts of trouble across investors. People who want you to go to market hear that and they think, oh no, you know, this entrepreneur is actually going to take 10 years to get to market when we want them to launch next month and vice versa. Uh, people do, are not serious about attacking regulatory and going through it and finding ways not to cut corners. Then, uh, and, and they're sort of always looking to cut corners, then they're not serious about pursuing the regulatory path. So I would just say it's okay to, be, to do it uh, one after the other, but do not be, uh, I could do either. And do not walk into meetings saying, what do you think? Give me your advice. That it's, and I would say that just doesn't kind of work is our experience. Um, then, and uh, to us as investors, we're fine. Like, we don't mind that things take 13 years to prove real, but I will tell you for our alumni, uh, it's very, very serious that you are, finding that traction and finding those partnerships and finding a way to really create inflection points. And if regulatory is a long way away, it's a problem. You need to get developing uh, your drugs. Mm -hmm. Mouse sucks as a model for human longevity. And the reason is mice live two years, humans live a really long time. I would love to see things done on bats rather than mice because bats are much more like humans they live a long time if you can now the problem is your science then takes a long time the reason we use mice and the reason we use c elegans is because they they're, they're really quick but even even the neuronal cells like the brain is a huge bigger factor in longevity than i think anyone really values that's part of our perception but even if you're working on neuronal cells, those are not old. Unfortunately, they don't mimic. Our cortical neurons will live 90 years. And the ones we're testing in vitro are like a week old. And they already have senescence. They do this kind of features and you can work with them, but they're not really good models. And I actually think we need much better models to really try to unpack this. Um, there's a massive gap between humans and the models that we use in this space. Um, we're still investing in it and we're still actively doing it. We have quite a few companies just signed another one that we're financing, but I would say I'd love to see like core technologies or really better models of what works here. And I'd love to see far more emphasis on the brain as the instrument of longevity um, rather than just say cells or muscle cells. I would second that. I would suggest that among the different um, systems within the body, uh, we have the least understanding about how brain works. 
and of course because of that we are least equipped to deal with uh, uh, diseases of central nervous system in fact i was at a conference just a couple of years ago and one of the ceos of major multinational companies said look we have kind of just put aside our focus on it because we just don't know how brain works so we're not going to develop drugs to deal with things like alzheimer's or other diseases so to me it's kind of surprising that uh, we don't have more focus on it compared to let's say cancer compared to other types of um, uh, systems immune systems even we have order of magnitude less understanding of how brain cells work and how brain modulates different parts of the body and how it impacts longevity and certainly our mental health and i would like to see a lot more on that mm. i heard on uh, anderson horace podcast uh, they explained that uh, now uh, their modern researcher researcher use a brain tissue uh, for mm -hmm researchers do you know i think for you know this and uh, this is not uh, from mice or any other animals it's uh, from uh, you know. we're, we're actually yeah. looking to bring we're looking to bring a company over from india actually um I mean, number one, genomics obviously is a space that we're, 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 we're I mentioned it earlier, but we have a, a company that have already raised about 50 million, but all of that was for studies. So we have one of the largest studies in the world of about 8,000 people, all the way up to the neck, not beyond the neck, but all the way up to the neck. But there's another really great company out of India that we just saw who are doing brain tests. And those brain tests are already being used in hospitals over in India. And even though it can't say you are 72% of what 100% would look like, it can tell you where you are versus where you were last week and the week before and the week before and the week before. And I think part of the lack of understanding of the brain is just because we don't do anything about it. Everybody thinks, oh my gosh, I just hope I'm okay for as long as I'm okay. And if I catch Alzheimer's or something goes wrong, well, that's bad luck. And actually getting very preventative and saying, how do we actually get to a much earlier stage in life and start measuring everything we have? I agree with 100% with the point on big data, but I love measurement and I love to be able to measure. Okay, uh, well, I mean, the, the simple thing is we, our whole network is, because Lou mentioned this, like understand that our whole network of investors would find a $50 million exit a disappointment. Sort of like, oh, that's nice. Okay, put it there. And that and that means for startups that they need to dream big. They mm -hmm. need to dream really big and be really disruptive and have a vision where they could be a very, very big company. That's what our whole syndicate of investors are interested in. I, I, I admire other like syndicates and networks that are interested in other kinds of stuff. Quicker returns. They're really happy with that. I wish I wish we had that. We don't. But so definitely our bias is towards disruptive things that could be really, really big businesses. Yeah, yeah. I think that open list, I uh, agree with you. <laughs> and uh, here at the end of the discussion, thank you very much. Uh, that was so nice to talk with you. And thank you very much for that. Thanks for having uh, us. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for sharing. Yeah, Thank you. And we'll stay on for the for Yeah, the you Thank can you. stay with us. Uh, that today we will be listening to uh, pitches uh, of free selected startups. They are selected for our fundraising program and they will be presented today and at our biohacking congress and uh, uh, we will provide a lot of uh, fundraising services for them. Hopefully we will help them close their rounds. Uh, and um, each uh, founder today will have uh, 30 minutes uh, for presentation. We suggest up to 10 minutes for pitch and uh, around 20 minutes for Q&A session with uh, investors. So each startup will share a screen, will show uh, slides. Just uh, I remind you about this. Um, please try to be as much efficient as you can. <laughs> And uh, yeah, mm, so I see investors, all investors, please uh, turn on your uh, microphones and videos. Uh, we would like to have some introduction from you. Tim, please. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi. And Julia, thanks a lot for your invitation. Uh, it's great to be here today. My name is Tim. I'm an associate at the Longevity Vision Fund. I joined LVF a year ago. Um, before that, I spent five years 
in strategy consulting, helping big pharma and biotech companies shape their commercial and portfolio strategy and optimize performance. Um, just a couple of words about our fund. At LVF, we invest in advanced therapeutics and diagnostic platforms and medical devices. Uh, some of our recent investments are for the molecular therapeutics, which is a gene therapy, um, a next generation AAV focused company backed by Pfizer, Receptive Advisors, and others. Um, Sigilon, an encapsulated cell therapy company backed up by flagship pioneering and Freenom, a liquid biopsy company, um, which um, does the early cancer protection. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here today and excited to hear pitches. Thank you. Thank you. Vidya? Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. I represent Red Tree Venture Capital, and we are a new life, sci new life sciences fund that is investing in uh, innovation that is coming out from academic institutions on the West Coast. So we focus on early stage companies, and we are quite involved in company formation as well. And we support the companies in capital as well as uh, operational support, starting from the pre-seed round all the way to Series A as well as Series B through exit. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Tant. Oh, hello, Tant. Hi, um, my name is Tunde. I am representing the Blue Venture Fund. Um, we work with uh, the 36 Blue Cross Blue Shield health plans in the United States and the association. And we invest across the spectrum of healthcare, from healthcare services and IT to advanced diagnostics. And uh, we're looking for things that are strategic values to the health plans. And that's where we're gonna be able to add the most value. So mm -hmm. pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm. Samos up. Um, Hi everyone. Samos up here, Julia. Thank you for having me on the panel. Um, great to meet you all. Uh, I'm here from Civilization Ventures. We're an early and mid-stage startup fund that invests in deep tech um, across three main areas, synthetic biology, digital health, and genomics uh, for everything from diagnostics to platform therapeutics. Uh, we've been in operation since 2017, have about 30 companies in our portfolio. Um, just closed our second fund, which we're investing out of. Uh, so yes, very excited to be here. My background is I've been doing uh, life science research for the last 10 years, started in cancer and glioblastoma, uh, finished up my PhD from Stanford, studied stem cell biology, regenerative medicine, uh, largely through the lenses of neuroscience, uh, just trying to understand the molecular drivers behind neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, so that's a bit about me and excited to be here. Great to meet you all. Thank you, Martin. Hi, I'm Martin Tobias. Um, I, uh, for the last three years, I was the CEO of Upgrade Labs, which was a biohacking facility with uh, Dave Asprey down in, San, in Santa Monica. Um, I left there in March and I'm back to doing uh, angel investing. Uh, I've invested in 90 companies myself um, in the last five years. Um, recently in the biohacking and longevity space, I invested in this thing. It's the Happy, um, which is software version of over-the-counter drugs. And um, I have a group of about 100 guys where we're doing uh, an angel list syndicate. I'm going to put about 5 million of my own capital in the next two years into early stage deals. And we're going to leverage that with a, about 20 more million with the other 100 guys that we have. Um, we just closed two deals. One was a um, company called Silver Tree Labs, which is doing a new wearable for adults with RRE Ventures out of New York and a uh, medical records uh, oncology uh, company out of India called Mango Sciences. Thank you very much. Happy to see you today. <laughs> Hi, Adam. Thanks for joining us again. Hey, Julia. Uh, Good to see you again. How are you? Yeah, Thanks for the invitation. Delighted to be here. So I'm Adam Deacon, I'm Managing Director uh, of the Health Tech Vertical for Dream Adventures. I'm flanked by Elliot down there. Say hello, Elliot. Um, he's, he's part of the Health Tech team. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Uh, so Dreamit is a venture fund. We're Philadelphia based. Uh, this is our third fund. We've been at it for about 10 years. We've worked with over 130 companies. Uh, what's really unique about us though, is while we're a seed and late sort of late seed series A investor, uh, and we focus on digital health and med tech, we also run what could be loosely described as an accelerator. We prefer to call it a growth platform. Um, so that we're working with a very select number of companies, typically six to eight companies at any given point in time, 
selected from the nearly 400 that apply to the program. And we, we pride ourselves in adding a significant value through this network of over 70 enterprise healthcare systems, payers, large multinationals, big pharma partners who give our companies red carpet access to decision makers within their organizations because they know we're bringing them the very best companies. And so that accelerates customer acquisition. We do the same thing on the back end of our program for our companies by getting them access to a network of nearly a thousand venture funds who take a look at each one of these cohorts, decide who they wanna meet with. Uh, our track record's pretty good. About half of our companies will close an institutional round after getting out of Dream It, and then we co-invest in the vast majority um, of those companies. Okay. Uh, and so we're always looking for great startups. Mm -hmm. If you know any, just send them our way. <laughs> Irina? Irina? Hi, uh, Irina Lanin with uh, VU uh, Venture Partners. Um, we are actually, um, uh, I'm a sector agnostic fund, however, I'm focusing uh, there on, uh, on the healthcare side. And a little bit uh, of background to myself, I um, have uh, 15 years of experience in, in Big Pharma with uh, some of them Merck. Um, and most recently I, I switched to the venture capital side and um, I'm looking for now at healthcare um, uh, in, in investments and um, I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you, David. David, hi. David, ciao. Hey, hello, Julia. Great to be back. So yes, my name is David Chow. I run a couple of things. Number one, we have a small fund, I-15 Ventures. Uh, health tech is uh, right now is our number one sector. It used, used to be the number two in sectors. We also have uh, Elevate, I-15 Elevate Accelerator, which is focused on earlier stage uh, companies in health tech, uh, education, and uh, fun tech uh, companies. We are California based. I also organize Silicon Valley Entrepreneurs, which is the largest uh, entrepreneur community in the Valley. And we run global startup competitions. Yes. I also see with us uh, Yai Yan and uh, Yuan Ping. Uh, however, they are muted and without video. All other investors, it seems, we already had at the panel. Yeah, Yan Ping. Hi, uh, you can just call me YP Julia. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, so I represent Applied Ventures here. Uh, I am, uh, we are the corporate venture arm of Applied Materials, uh, the world's largest semiconductor equipment providers. Uh, but we are also very interested in the intersection between semiconductor uh, technology and the emerging kind of like uh, omics analysis and diagnostics. And we have made a bunch of investments uh, in the field, including a company called Ontera and another company called AltiView. Uh, so I'm uh, looking forward to the, um, to the startup pitch today and always looking for uh, new exciting opportunities out there. A little bit of, um, of myself. So I've been in uh, uh, corporate venture for a couple of years beforehand. I had a background in management consulting as well as a PhD in biomedical sciences. Thank you. So now, so now let's start our uh, first speech. Our first speech will be Sana Health. So Richard, we invite you to share your screen and please introduce Sana Health. And, uh, hello, hello to um, various of my long-term supporters who are, who are there. Um, Adam, uh, very, very good to see you. And uh, any of the other startups listening, <laughs> Apply to dream it. They are awesome. <laughs> Wait, I'm uh, sorry. I didn't hear that, Richard. Could, could you say it again? <laughs> dream it are awesome. Everyone should apply. You can. <laughs> um, they're joking apart. They were a very, very large part of um, us seeing uh, where we fit into the hospital ecosystem. Um, it was immensely helpful to actually go around multiple uh, providers in a short amount of time and hear the the sequence of feedback and what was actually needed in the marketplace. I mean, it was really invaluable. Um, anyway, uh, on to us. Um, we're all about chronic pain relieved. Um, I had an accident in the Yemen uh, in 1992. I was driving down, I was driving a Jeep down a road near the capital Sanaa, um, hence the company name. And I had a choice of a head-on collision next to a petrol truck or to go off a bridge. And I went off a bridge down into a dry riverbed and all of that uh, resulted in a nerve damage, uh, sorry, in, in 
a spinal cord injury, T8, T10, so belly button level, plus a traumatic brain injury, plus an aortic tear. And all of that resulted in a nerve damage pain problem that was so severe, I was given a, a five-year life expectancy. So went through the standards of care. Um, that hasn't changed in 28 years. There are marginal improvements in some areas of the standard of care. Basically, there's no change. Um, and so I had to find a solution. So how does this apply to um, everyone else? Well, uh, most of you in the healthcare, so most of you know the size of the pain problem. Um, the overall chronic pain problem size is, is 50 million uh, people. Um, of that, fibromyalgia is, is one of the worst and most intractable and least uh, uh, serviced uh, problems. Uh, 10 million people, the average person on fibromyalgia takes uh, five to eight drugs, one for each of the compounding comorbidities, and that causes its own problems in itself. Um, pain in general uh, is 59% of people uh, relying on opioids, um, and then obviously the, the, the problems that come from that. So as a, as a market size, um, 77.8 billion is the treatment size for, um, for chronic pain. Within that, we believe there's a 20 uh, billion market for uh, fibromyalgia. The average person is paying 10K a year in medical costs. Um, so the market needs a effective non-drug solution. So I needed it for myself, and it's clearly a need that other people have as well. So meet Sana. Uh, this is the current version of the device, and you can see it on the left there. Uh, what someone does is they put the device on, they press start, and they're getting a complex sequence of pul gentle pulses of light through closed eyes and sound through the ears, which is then generating a very deep relaxation effect in about 10 minutes. Um, in early clinical results, across uh, average across three clinical trials so far that are completed, uh, 20 to 40 percent reduction in pain, depending on the type of pain it is, 49 percent reduction in depression, and 45 percent reduction in anxiety. And just for reference, that means we're out we're outperforming tramadol, uh, Prozac, and, and Xanax. Um, we are also collecting data uh, from the set, the sensor in the middle of the forehead, uh, and we're collecting subject of data every time someone is actually using the device. In the next generation of the device, that's going to enable us to tailor that to each individual uh, with a closed loop feedback system, um, which we have very strong IP on. Uh, so we are treating all the comorbid symptoms. Now, this is one of the really big challenges in chronic pain, is you have pain, anxiety, sleep, and depression, all in a complex compounding comorbidity. And within fibromyalgia, you're usually adding on fibromyalgia as well. And we are able to, because we're going to an underlying level, we're able to treat all of those uh, different areas. So how are we working? So we're working with audio-visual neuromodulation. We are using a way to affect uh, the auditory and visual cortex to use them as our electronic keypad into the brain. Now, because you've got two eyes and two ears, and the way in which they're wired into the two hemispheres of the brain, it enables you to actually recreate what's called hemispheric balance. Now, there was research done um, primarily on EEG of long-term meditators um, on specific standardized testing that showed the long -term, the longest-term meditators all ended up with this thing called hemispheric balance. Now, originally, when I had my pain problem, I tested my brain on the same equipment. I showed that I had a very large disparity between the amount of activity in the two hemispheres, and I was able to fix that. That gave me my roadmap, which I was then able to fix. And over about the course of three months, uh, it wiped out all of my underlying nerve damage pain. Now, all pain is a, is a combination of central mediation, how your brain is processing the signal, and peripheral pain, the actual pain signal that's coming in. And in my type of spinal cord injury and TBI pain, it was 100% how the brain was processing the signal. There was a corrupted data stream, not really a pain signal. So very similar to a phantom limb. So we're a silver bullet in special cases like me. And the other end of the scale would be something like chronic regional pain syndrome, where we are a tool in the toolkit to lower the amount of opioids. Fibromyalgia sits smack in the middle of that, where it's a very large central mediation challenge but you also have peripheral pain. Um, the teams go off this. Um, I've been asked this. I, I am now the world expert in this, this area. Uh, Tasha Bond um, was our um, mentor at MedTech Innovator. 
Um, I poached her to be our COO. She's had four exits, uh, all of them class three devices. So she's very uh, well experienced in compliance and regulatory and manufacturing. Uh, Steve was um, with her in the top team of one of these companies that she exited, which was iDev, that exited to Abbott for 1.5 billion. Um, and Jeff Auer, we, 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 we poached from Achille, um, who are the leaders in the neuroscience uh, at FDA. Um, and total team of 14, uh, split between, the rest was split between clinically and clinical and regulatory. Um, so I'll go to market. Uh, fibromyalgia is where we're starting. Um, our early pilot of 20 people showed that we were five times better at improving quality of life than Lyrica uh, with zero side effects. Um, Lyrica, the side effects are so bad that 80% of people stop taking it. We, on the other hand, have 85% compliance at the end of a year with people voluntarily using the device now uh, a year after that first trial. Um, in that trial and in the follow-up, we've seen a 30% drop in all pain meds over that entire period of time. Um, we are going to test a $50 a month paid out of pocket uh, for the next year while we're going through the reimburse process. Now, we are halfway through our pivotal FDA study with Duke, um, and that will read out in January. So if you look at the column on the right, uh, Duke is a study that's underway now, or halfway through. The Mighty is a patient advocacy group that has 289,000 fibromyalgia members already. And they are our partner for rolling out the thousand person user test, which will allow us to test that paid out of pocket. And they are also our route to the first uh, couple of hundred thousand people um, that uh, we want to target. Uh, Mount Sinai is a neuropathic pain study, 120 person study that will be our second FDA indication. That'll be a, a uh, that'll be a 510k. Anthem, um, we've been having long uh, discussions with about uh, a back pain study for um, lowering the cost of lower back pain. Uh, their internal data shows that when someone has a back pain surgery, it has an ROI of precisely zero. Uh, for a $40,000 uh, uh, treatment, that's uh, pretty uh, appalling. So they are trying to limit the amount of surgeries that people have by, by um, giving alternative treatments. And we are in discussions with them about that. Um, various other things in our pipeline, which I can come to uh, in questions. But just on fibromyalgia alone, just on our first indication, if we get to 2% of the target market, we are on 100 million ARR. Uh, we're looking at a $50 a month, um, subscription out of pocket to start with um, at a higher price when reimbursed because we'll be integrated into EHRs. Uh, our COGS at scale at 75 bucks. Um, and I can get, go into more of this on questions. So yeah, the, the FDA trial is already halfway through. It'll read out in January. Um, and then the mighty study uh, will happen, will start in January. Um, so funds raised since we started, 11 million so far. Uh, that's led, been led in three rounds by Founders Fund. Um, thank you again to Dreamit and Adam who've uh, invested in us uh, twice now, uh, including the safe note part of the current round. Um, the, 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 on top of that, so this round has really been in two parts. The first part's been a safe note round, which is all internal capital. On top of that, we've been raising an equity round, which has uh, been a five million uh, is a five million raise. We've closed on 2.5 million already. Uh, we have some soft commits, but basically there's 2.5 million open. Uh, that is to get to three milestones. One is uh, through FDA approval. The second is the commercial pathway study, and the third is the engineering to lower cogs. And just as a, a reference, the three comparators to us uh, that had FDA approval and the first 500 plus commercial proof study, uh, Carla Health, Achille and Pear, all of whom had the first pre-money and the next round of being 150 million plus. Um, so uh, please uh, join us on uh, the journey to end chronic pain. Chronic pain is about how the brain amplifies pain and that's what we're working on. Uh, we can't go off to acute pain, um, but we can go off to chronic pain and that's what we're aiming to end. So over for questions. Perfect. I would like to emphasize that we do this very much uh, to this startup and this team. <laughs> yeah. Um, investors, please ask your questions. Great technology, great uh, device. Yeah. Yeah, may I go first? Yeah, cool. Uh, Richard, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, Tim from Longevity Vision Fund. A um, couple of quick questions. Uh, so 
if you could share the feedback from providers that you got, um, that's the first one. And the second one is um, this device, does it provide sort of, um, a therapy um, as a one course or do you have to use it continuously throughout your whole life to um, sort of to have the same effect? Uh, how does it work? Yeah, so, so let me ask the second question first. So uh, it depends on the, it depends on the um, particular uh, indication. So something like uh, we, we have a, a trial um, that we have uh, applied for an NINR grant with UPenn um, on post-operative pain. Um, if you have a knee operation, you have a, uh, sorry, a knee replacement, you have a 60% chance of having lifelong chronic pain. Uh, we're aiming to cut that by about 50%. Um, that would be a month use of device before surgery and a month afterwards. Um, something like uh, my position, uh, it was three months and I've never had to use it again. I'm now a health and wellness user. I use it every time I fly or every time I work too late and then need to go to bed. Um, on fibromyalgia, we tell people use it twice a day. Um, and then on top of that, whenever you needed to, because your symptoms are too much for you to enjoy what you're doing. We started an average of five times a day. Um, each session is 16 minutes. And uh, by the three month mark post the trial, the average person was using just less than once a day. And that's still the same a year later. So once a day appears to be the, the maintenance dose for fibromyalgia. So all, again, it depends on the degree to which it's central mediation versus peripheral pain. The chronic regional pain syndrome people, um, typically they were using two or three times a day, every day continuously. And if they stopped using the device, it took about a month for their pain levels to go back up to the pre-managed levels. So it's, that's the kind of ratio. Um, on the on the on the provider side, um, our, our most in-depth discussions have been with Anthem and Harvard Pilgrim. Um, Anthem are intent on on us uh, addressing lower back pain before um, anything else for them because it's their highest financial priority, and uh, they, they they are uh, organising to fund a study uh, for 120 people with lower back pain. Um, anecdotally, we know that we've got about a 30% um, very high responder rate and about a 30% medium and about a 40% not. Again, it depends on how much of that back pain is um, governed by uh, the central mediation, so anxiety. And roughly 30% of lower back pain or people with lower back pain report anxiety being the largest driver of their back pain. Um, so, and, and they are so, they're, they're so keen to do that. Uh, for lower back pain, that they've said that if we, once the study is done, they would reimburse us as a wellness device prior to FDA approval because they see such a large cost saving there to be to be made. Um, Harbour Pilgrim have already listed us as a wellness device um, on their wellness offering to, to members. Um, they also are interested in lower back pain. Uh, and then fibromyalgia, they've said as soon as we have uh, the FDA uh, FDA approval plus peer review data uh, that they will um, that they will reimburse. Does that answer both questions? Yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it seems you answered the question. Uh, maybe um, more questions. Hey, Richard, this is Tunde uh, from the Blue Venture Fund. Wondering how soon do you expect um, the clinical trials to be completed? I think you had mentioned, uh, the, but I just wanted to make sure. Yes, certainly. So, so the Duke study um, will, the efficacy portion will read out in January. The Mount Sinai study will be about a month later. It'll be either February or March. Both, both are now being done as remote studies. Duke was, uh, Duke was set up as a remote from the start. So they've been recruiting very quickly. Um, Mount Sinai actually started earlier, but had to stop because of COVID and is now being relaunched as a, as a remote study. So it sh that should be done in, in, in February or March. That means that we will have our first FDA indication um, mid, uh, sorry, end of March, if we get breakthrough status for Fibro, which we should do, um, and then April, May, if we don't. And then the neuropathic pain will be a self-predicated 510K. And the longest cohort that you have, uh, you're tracking is with that Duke study? 
the, so the, the longest, the, 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 the year that we already have on fibromyalgia was our first pilot, which was 20 people. Okay. And just as a reference, um, the Duke study only has to have 20% of the effect size of the pilot to, for us to sail through FDA. Uh, do you have any more questions? So, uh, Yan Yan, still without video and uh, without audio. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, sorry, hi, excuse everyone. me for the, the, <laughs> the camera. So it's uh, pretty late here. It's in the night and I don't want to wake up my oh. partner. So I just uh, keep the light off. And uh, so I'm from W Harper. W Harper is a cross-border fund. Uh, so we majorly invest in, in uh, the US uh, and uh, Greater China. And currently we are managing three funds. Uh, one US dollar fund, one MB fund, and one uh, US dollar fund, but it's uh, dedicated to uh, Taiwanese entrepreneurs or, or companies with, uh, with uh, significant operation in Taiwan. Uh, so we, we invest in early stage companies, so seed, pre-A or A round stage, and the ticket size is between one to Five million, so we don't write big checks, and uh, we invest in all kind of uh, healthcare companies. So, from device therapeutics, digital health, healthcare service, etc. So, you have uh, good opportunities. Uh, we always welcome uh, the opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions uh, to Sana Health? Maybe I have a questions. question. Yeah, please. Yeah. Oh, hey, Richard. Good uh, presentation. This is Martin. Um, can you? I didn't get the cost of your device. And the second question, and and how many sales you know units you've sold now, or if you're still just in R and D. And then the second part of it is on the FDA side. Are you getting FDA approval because you're making medical claims to cure diseases, or is it? just you because you're using some TCDS or it's the electronics uh, thing and you know is there a, would there be an opportunity to sell this device to consumers without medical claims uh, yes both good questions so so we have a 513g approval already um, so we are um, we have the official confirmation that we are a low risk device uh, which does then mean that the de novo and the 510ks are purely um, around efficacy because um, Carlos Pinto has already signed off um, we, we are on market um, as a wellness device through the website, um, and we've sold 150 so far on complete stealth mode um, because we, we, have some, we have some COVID uh, supply constraints, and we're trying to make sure that uh, the thousands that we need to sell for the Mighty Study Direct, um, we have enough devices for it. Uh, because basically going into the next round, if we, if we only sell direct to consumer um as a wellness device we get we, we've seen that we get people buying for almost anything you can imagine that, that that's a real problem in their life um from sleep and fatigue that we've got a lot of um, data on all the way through to tbi and that's great but it doesn't help us sell the investment story for series a where i want to be able to say this because currently our cac is basically zero and obviously that's not going to continue longer term so I thought, okay, if we take a thousand people out of the 289,000 people from the Mighty, we'll have a very strong argument about how our CAC is going to stay under control um, for the for the short term. So yeah, the FDA is purely about the marketing claims. Um, we become a class two as soon as we are talking about any at-risk population. So anything pain or, or sleep or uh, mental health related. Um, the FDA have said they're going to treat everything pain related that we do as one bucket. So that's one de novo, and then everything else is a self-predicated 510k. And then in the mental health bucket, in which they include addiction, anxiety, and depression, all of which we've either got studies done or we're, we've got studies planned, they will require one more de novo uh, in the mental health bucket, and then everything else within that bucket will be a self-predicated 510k. Um, and then on the cost of the device, um, it's it, at scale will be sub $100 to as, uh, for COGS and then we're going out on a subscription um, the mighty study we're aiming just to test the direct consumer at $50 a month because we don't know what the macroeconomic situation is going to be like 
Um, we know that fibro people have a tendency to um, have lost their jobs and have further financial difficulties. Um, on the reimbursed side, uh, the discussions with Anthem and Harvard Pilgrim have been about $100 a month. Um, they will get a lot more for that as well because it'll be integrated into the standard of care. So it'll be integrated into EHRs and, and doctor phys uh, physician portals and so on. Um, so slightly different offering, same underlying tech um, than at the 100 bucks a month. We are making some military sales already. Um, some have gone to Canadian Special Operations Command for fatigue mitigation. Um, and the military seem to be uh, have a great preference for buying up front. And those devices are being sold for $1,800 uh, a piece. Does that answer both questions? Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the time is almost over. So we have just a few minutes for one more question. If you have uh, one more short question, please. Julia, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. Uh, Richard, <clears throat> very intriguing. Uh, maybe I missed it, but can you talk a little bit about the where your IP is coming from? What kind of competitive moat do you have around your IP? And wh what is the competitive situation out there with other technologies and other devices? So you say, what was the very first part of that question? So the I, first part IP is, what is the origin of the IP? Yeah. Oh, the origin and, of the IP. Yeah, yeah. and how so, defensible it is. Do you have any patents and any kind of uh, uh, proprietary uh, part that uh, can't be easily duplicated. Yeah, certainly. So, so basically, the the, the I, I originally came up with the idea from looking at all of the research that went into long term uh, meditation and how meditation changes the brain. That's how I sort of backed into okay, these are the frequencies I need, and this is how, and, and how do I get there? Um, the, the 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 file that we we've had two um, two patents published. Uh, issued. Uh, one was issued for in June last year, and that covers the combined use of auditory visual stimulation uh, for the treatment of almost every, uh, well, it covers everything we have anecdotal data on, uh, which is everything we're now working on and a lot more. So uh, pain, TBI, PTSD, stroke, sleep, um, you name it, we ran around getting slight, small bits of anecdotal data, and that was that. So that all went into the first pattern. So anybody trying to use any audio visual stimulation of the MIC pattern uh, mm -hmm. will not be able to uh, breach that first patent. The second patent, which was issued two weeks ago, um, covers the sensor on the forehead and creating a closed loop feedback system, and that will that will cover any closed loop feedback system that does anything visual, auditory, or tactile, or any combination of those three. Um, after that, we have uh, four further patents, no, five further patents that are filed uh, in pain, anxiety, depression, addiction, and fibromyalgia. And those expand on the foundational patent by broadening the claims to include any auditory signal or any visual signal separate as well as together. Um, so that's really that's really the first moat. Um, the the next moat is the FDA, um, because someone else is going to have to prove what they're doing. If someone tries to do just auditory or just visual, um, first of all, they will have to prove efficacy. Um, so that's the first challenge, and the second challenge will be that uh, the, the, the that that the the the, four, the five latest patterns um, will cover that. Um, in terms of competition, um, within the fibromyalgia space, people were paying $450 a month out of pocket in the largest test ever, study ever done on it, and that was in 2012. Half of that was paid out of pocket for drugs, um, and half of it was massage, acupuncture, and other alternative treatments. So on a dollar-by-dollar -dollar basis, massage and acupuncture really are our initial uh, competition. Um, and obviously, during the time of COVID, uh, people um, can't go get their massages and acupuncture. No, um, I'm sorry, I meant competition in uh, other similar platforms like neurofeedback devices. Yeah, so um, the the big one is probably VR, um, and 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 applied VR is is the one I I I watch most closely. Um, VR is basically split into two categories. Um, there are 
there are some odd, there are some straight, there are some sessions like Karina are doing something really smart in niche areas. Um, but by and large, it's either distraction therapy, which we massively outcompete, um, or cognitive behavior therapy delivered through VR, um, which also we, we also we outcompete on, on efficacy. Um, fibromyalgia is such a large market that is so poorly served that I think it's going to be a while until we really butt heads um, with direct competitors. Um, I do regard people like Applied VR as potential collaborators in future, because ultimately what we have is a direct stimulation device that is um, much better at addressing problems when they are at their worst, whereas the cognitive behavioral therapy, it tends to have better results when people have come off that worst phase and they've already got some improvements happening. So I, I kind of I, I kind of regard those guys as, as future collaboration, um, although there was some competitive nature as well there. Um, the on the TDCS TDS, uh, T, uh, TDCS side, um, not on fibromyalgia. Um, yes, on the depression side, um, very much so on the wellness side, um, but. They, 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 they will take a while to get to those those markets. We're basically focusing on the areas where we can have the largest impact with the people who've got the worst problems. Um, and we are definitely outperforming TGSCS in, in all of those areas quite significantly. Um, when you come down into the sort of more wellness areas and people are having milder problems, um, then TGCS is, is, is a much uh, bigger type of uh, competition for us. Richard, uh, yeah, thanks for your answer. That's it. Yeah, because uh, we have a uh, next startup. I would like to invite Macromaltic, Monica. Thank you, everyone, before I go. Thank you very much. Okay, does that come up okay? Can you see the presentation? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so at Macromal Tech, we design targeted antibodies that are 50 times cheaper to discover and can be found in under a week. And my name is Monica Brando. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Macromal Tech. So I did my PhD in chemical engineering at Johns Hopkins University, where I was studying the correlations between structure and function of proteins using software. Um, initially, I did both the wet lab and the computational work for my thesis. But I quickly realized that I didn't enjoy the lab work as much. So the second half of my work was entirely computational, collaborating with other scientists who did the wet lab work um, to carry out validations. So this allowed me to go beyond just what I learned or what I did for my PhD, but also really understand the um, how software could be used to create better proteins. Towards the end of my PhD, I got interested in the commercial aspects of the software. And I wanted to understand why scientists in industry specifically at pharma companies, we're not using it to develop new drugs. And so what I found is that there's a big disconnect between the academic problems that software was designed to answer and the problems that industry needed to answer. And so um, most of the companies that I talked to, about 90% of them, wanted software that was focused around antibodies. And so that's what I did when I um, started Macromultech was keep that in mind. And so we've built software um, and all of the algorithms from the ground up and have focused our algorithms specifically on antibodies and what makes antibody antigen interactions unique from other protein protein interactions. This has allowed us to make giant strides in an area where others have really struggled. And so aside from myself, my co-founder is Susanna Kaufman. Um, she's my mom and she taught me how to program at a really young age and set me along the path to where I am today. Her background is in chemical engineering and she has over 20 years of experience in systems development, much of it for the fintech industry. The fact that you can check your bank account on your phone today in a fraction of a second, you have that, her to thank for that. So why focus on drug discovery? The average drug takes about 15 years and $2.5 billion to develop. And about 1 billion of that is often occurring before you even get to humans. Most drug candidates never make it to humans, much less get released to the market because of the high failure rates. And so that's what we wanna address is how do you make you know, strides in that timeline and also reduce the failure rates. Today's methods for discovering drugs have two main problems that, that we address. One is that you can, they can only access targets that are well understood and easy to work with. 
And the second is that they often come from animal systems, which means that there's still a lot of work to do and a lot of areas where they can fail before they ever get put into humans. We've built a system that enables us to bind previously inaccessible targets very rapidly. We're using this integrated systems approach, we're able to take advantage of novel biophysical modeling, trained neural networks, and wet lab validation. And through the systematic approach, our software is able to continuously learn and improve. And this allows us to get to where we can build antibodies in weeks instead of years. So every new project we do increases a key aspect of the technology, be that accuracy, speed, or predictability. We feed that back into the system and we get better every time. And this allows us to eventually get to where we can have fully validated antibodies in a matter of weeks. Right now we're at about two months. So already we've been able to design antibodies to over a dozen targets with a diverse set of disease indications. So in these two examples I have, um, we were provided very little information about the target. In the antibody on the left, we had no antibodies that had ever been attempted before against this target. Um, and in our first attempt, we were able to test and validate a handful of antibodies with this desired properties. In the second example, we worked with a partner who had tried various methods of discovering antibodies and had never gotten any successful experiments. So here again, in our first attempt, we were able to generate a handful of antibodies with desired properties and which have now been shown to be functional antibodies. And so as a YC graduate, we know how to build and grow fast. We've raised over a million dollars in non-dilutive capital from the National Science Foundation and later $2.8 million from the likes of Neotribe and Data Collective. We've already generated over $350,000 um, dollars in revenue from half a dozen paid pilot programs with leading biopharma companies. And with that, we've created a pipeline of more than $450 million for antibody development contracts with biotech and pharma alike. We work with a split business model. So we have a different set of um, different type of return from biotech versus larger pharma companies, where we share IP and revenue with smaller biotech companies and work more collaborative with them. And then with pharma companies, we just get milestone payments off preclinical and clinical development assets once they start to develop them. And those, those milestones are worth about $50 million for each uh, target with the larger pharma companies. So with this raise, we hope to hit profitability by late 2021. So we're opening a round of $5 million to build a lab and convert our $450 million pipeline into development contracts and start hitting some of those milestones. Don't miss out on a multi-billion dollar opportunity and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Now questions from investors. So uh, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, your uh, team and the, particularly how many full-time staff, how many part-time staff, or how long you have been working together? Yeah, so most of the team has been working together for about four years. Um, Suzanne and I worked on it for a little while before we hired anybody else. And we're a team of about 15 scientists. Um, about 10 of those are on the computational, so per pure computational, side of their work, but they all have biochemistry backgrounds. Um, and then four of them are do the actual lab work. So we do have a small lab where we, we test all of our antibodies. How does COVID impact your uh, teamwork? Um, well, so initially it impacted our lab because we had to shut it down for about a week and then figure out how we could have, you know, follow all the safety measures. So we slowed down a lot of what we could do because we could only have one person in the lab at a time. Um, but right now, I think it doesn't really impact any of that anymore. Um, and then the impact on the on the computational side has been more that we've had to learn how to use um, interactive tools that are computational ourselves rather than interacting in person. So we, we all work remotely, so we use a lot of remote tools for that. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question here about your therapeutic modality. So beyond antibodies, is your approach applicable to other protein structures or protein scaffolds? Yeah, so exactly. The idea would be to take what we've learned from antibodies and apply it to other scaffolds. But it would have to be scaffolds that are large families where we can generate similar data or apply some of the techniques of the data we've, uh, we understood about, like what makes an antibody unique. So we would need a really good generalizable scaffold to take what we've done and apply it to a different one. But yes, we've thought about that. So good question. Okay, thank you. 
We have time. More questions, please. Irina, Safa. I'll jump in. I don't know if I saw a, a competition slide. Just curious if you can touch on the competitive positioning. Yeah, so primarily our competition comes from like up and coming new wet lab technologies. So there are new ways that you can get antibodies that have proven to be very fast and efficacious. Um, I think what sets us apart is that when we design things computationally, we can be very targeted about where we're hitting on a protein. So we can go after epitopes that are more likely to be functional. And this also allows us to go after a really difficult target. So for example, if you have a protein that's in a class of proteins that has like hundreds of different, very, very similar proteins, we can narrow in on what makes one stand out from those others. So think about like GPCR classes or something where you have tons of really similar proteins and you wanna be able to single one out of them. Um, so our computational techniques allow us to do that. And, one of our examples is that second case study I had, which was one of those types of proteins. Um, and then as far as computational um, competition, there are a couple other companies that have started to do antibody design. Um, they take a more uh, AI based approach where they generate a lot of lab data and then go back and learn from the lab data. Whereas we've taken kind of the opposite approach, which is really understand antibodies, build out the processes and then test our, our hypotheses using the lab work and then feedback that way. Um, so just slightly different approaches. Uh, we have one question from uh, attendees. Uh, what kind of diseases are you targeting at the time? At the time? Sure. So uh, it, internally, we have a couple of different diseases, more, more in the rare disease space, so rare infections um, or rare cancers. But most of what we do is uh, with partners. And so therefore, it's, uh, you know, whatever the partner is, is targeting. And we've seen everything from neurodegenerative disease, um, a lot of like autoimmune disease targets um, and cancer targets. So uh, it, it doesn't really depend on the disease. It's more target specific rather than disease specific. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Irina, do you have may questions? I, oh? may, I, may I ask a question a little bit about the platform? Um, what is your proprietary data set that you're leveraging for epitope design um, and binding to certain classes of proteins? Yeah, so uh, our data comes from, you know, initially from public data. And then we've been able to generate both the, you know, wet lab data, so data that we can take in that has tested different hypotheses and feed that back in. But we also do a lot to generate, um, I guess, simulated data and are very careful about how we simulate that data to answer certain questions. Um, so we have a, you know, a really large data set that kind of covers all those different things. So while initially it was really built on public, publicly available data, I think at, at this point it's probably more like 2080, where 80% of what we have is our own data. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are you able to model also immunogenicity potential or any adverse event potential other than binding? Yeah, so a lot of what we did initially when we started um, when we started building out the platform was to try to um, think about, you know, how are different properties of antibodies taken into account. So we looked at things like developability um, and binding. And now, sorry, I think my music started playing somehow. Okay. Um, and, and so we've taken that into account. One of the things that we do when we build our antibodies is build them with a uh, human scaffold so that you end up with antibodies that have less likely, less likely to have an immunogenic effect. Um, so that's one of the ways we take that into account. The other thing is we know things that make antibodies work better. And so we just try to remove that from our data set or, or optimize around that in our data set. So we can't really test for it so much as take information and use that to guide how we build them in the first place. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Um, hi, Monica. Thanks for the presentation. I have a um, just quick question about the technology in, in general, how it works. So does a company uh, like a pharma company come to you with a target and then you design an antibody to bind to that target? Or do they come with an idea like a monoclonal antibody that I bring to you and uh, you just take and optimize it? No, we're, they come to us with target. So initially we did do a lot of like optimization um, but I think in the last two years, we've really focused on that whole design 
aspect of it and starting from target and not from known antibodies. Thanks. And if it's uh, an available data uh, without the CDA, how much does it cost to find an antibody that will bind to a particular target? Oh, that's a good question. So like, what does it cost us to generate a new antibody? Yeah. Um, that, that will target. <laughs> Yeah, Time? so I mean, it's it's yeah. it's uh, res like our our staff costs is really the okay. primary thing because it's all computational work and it's pretty inexpensive computationally. Like it, our our algorithms are incredibly efficient, so it's really not that. The part that's a little bit more costly is actually making the antibodies and testing them, uh, and that normally costs you know a couple thousand dollars per antibody. Okay, thank you. And, and do you actually do the testing of an antibody or you just create it um, like computationally? No, we, we test it. So we take all, what, the way, what we aim to do is get down to a really small set. So we're aiming for like 10 to 15 antibodies per target or per epitope more realistically. And then we'll you know, synthesize those, test them for binding. And then if we see binding, then we'll figure out what the right functional assay is to use and, and kind of progress a little bit from there. Yeah, thanks, Monica. And uh, just coming back to the price thing, um, how much would it cost to a company, of, like a pharma company? Essentially, what's your price tag for developing an antibody like that? Oh, right. So our price tag is in the milestones more than anything else. So our upfront cost is pretty modest. It's normally in like the hundred thousand dollar range, um, but the price is that that is really like fifty million dollars, right? Because if it makes it to market, that's what we're going to make off of it. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? G investors, please be active. Ask your questions. No? I, I would keep asking them because that's yeah, really interesting. <laughs> Just stop me once time's over. Um, so um, do you plan to expand into the uh, sort of drug development area and essentially develop your own proprietary uh, drugs at some point with your own targets that you can discover potentially um so if we so we do have our own internal pipeline but our plan is not to go past like animal models we would probably spin it out into joint ventures rather than develop it ourselves all right okay thanks and i mean that's obviously a very different question different field um to expand into transcriptomic medicines like like uh, rnai and viral vector design would that be completely different from what you have now or is it um like a small add-on to what you have now it could be an add-on because i think similar to that scaffold like a lot of the aavs have really common scaffolds that you could take advantage of and use it to you know target something else and we've talked about doing some stuff um we have like a a um, a vector we've been looking at on how we could do something similar or take advantage of like existing antibody information and apply it to that. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, if uh, you don't have more questions, uh, we can. Uh, thank you very much, Monica. That was great piece, and uh, thanks for all your answers. And uh, now I invite our next startup. Next startup, Suggestic. Victor, are you here with us? Please. So at Suggestic, we've created a personalized nutrition development platform. And so we can now modify our diet based on our genome, microbiome, glycemic response, or food sensitivities. However, even if we know what to eat, we still struggle to decide what to cook, what to order at a restaurant, or what to buy at the grocery store. We all need guidance. We need help knowing what is both good for our bodies and delicious to eat. And we need convenience. We want to know how and which are the best foods for us. So I'd suggest that our main insight was that uh, making it super easy and convenient to find delicious, affordable, and healthy foods was a data discovery problem that we could solve. We realized that if we could match what our body needs with the food we like the most, and then further match that to the food options around us, we could effectively allow for food to become medicine. And already most of us want food to be medicine. However, for this to work, we need mobile apps. We need mobile apps when we are at the kitchen, at the restaurant, or at the grocery store. And, and we need them to help us find the most convenient food options based on our personalized dietary needs. So 
there's already 60,000 nutrition related app publishers, everyone from health plans to fitness companies and from lab tests and nutraceuticals all have or want their own app. However, the problem is most apps take over two years to develop in order to cost over a million dollars. And all of them end up rebuilding the same modules and functionality, license the same data and implement very similar infrastructure. So as suggesting our, our, our platform allows them to build their own app either by using our APIs and SDKs or they can publish our white label version of our app that enables them to include meal planner, grocery lists, shopping lists, uh, uh, recipes and restaurant information directly into their apps. So our solution additionally allows them to build the guidance and suggestions in the form of create their own content, personalize it to each body by using different lab test devices, customize to each individual preferences, guide them through the process, suggest what they should eat, and then track and improve continuously the suggestions. So our customers create personalized nutrition content in the form of rule sets, guidance, and then bundle their own diagnostic coaching and nutrition products in such a way that if they are more content creators, they can have their own microbiome test, coaching and probiotics into one individual dietary program. This dietary program can then live not only in their app, but in third party apps as in United Healthcare, where they can, instead of building their own program, they can use third party programs in it. So every one of our programs can live not only in different white labeled apps, but also in third party apps. And this allows our customers to actually build something that enhances the user experience by giving them the tools and the guidance they need to succeed, including our augmented reality version of uh, or module, which overlays the top rated menu options at over 520,000 restaurants, 90% of restaurants in the US. And this is actually the, the kind of technology that we've been building and we have several patents behind it, including something that allows us to decode based on every menu item and its description, what are the ingredients and 179 nutrients behind each of them with an accuracy of 98.5 of area under the curve in an ROC, which is kind of like almost twice as good as a human. In addition to actually learning continuously, what are the things that people prefer? And what are the things that people that actually lead to the best outcomes? So at Suggestic, we help our customers build beautiful and powerful apps. We also help them publish their own programs and dietary content with their own lab tests, devices, coaching, and meals and supplements. And these bundles, they can then be delivered through their own apps or third-party apps. And finally, we expose all our building blocks so that they can incorporate this into their own portals and enhance their own apps. So we do not compete with program creators, app publishers, clinics, gyms, coaches, or dietitians. We actually empower them all to get to the consumers and improve this user experience. And as we all scale faster as an ecosystem by uh, making the user uh, more successful. So, and for the partners themselves, instead of two years of development time, they can release an app in as little as a week. And, and, and instead of paying millions of dollars up front, they pay per user per month. This alone, the development side of our business is already an 11 billion total addressable market, growing at a 44% a year company rate. And in addition to, we can also have revenue share from a lot of the diagnostics, coaching, food, and supplements that are distributed along with the programs. So this has allowed us, since we pivoted in January of this year into a B2B to C model, to continuously close contracts. And in the last 10 months, we've closed over $9 million in total contract value, 3.2 in ARR. And we have over a million more in final contract in stage out of 72 qualified opportunities in our pipeline and 170 leads. We get one to three leads per day coming in through the internet and, and with almost no marketing at all. And it, between our customers that have already closed other United Healthcare, MyDNA, Biome, and among others. So as we also 
have released our Android version this month, and, and we are increasing very quickly our monthly run rate and expect to get to cash flow positive in Q1 of this year. And also the Android version and, and the deployments we have are reducing the time lag between closing the contracts and actually monetizing them. So our competitive advantages for all of our customers are that we are the only ones who have a platform that has full data and functionality that they can't get anywhere else. In addition to the ability to fully personalize include restaurant or mental reality. And most importantly, it allows the partners to create their own content, share it with other app distributors and publishers and have this content or this, these rule sets, this, these programs filter out any type of grocery, recipe, meal plan or restaurant menu item. So we have many potential exit strategies. Our main objective evidently is an IPO. By, by, but by sitting in the intersection of three major industries, we, are, we see that any of our partners or customers could end up being an acquirer. In fact, we've already had six acquisition inquiries from companies as varied as Samsung, Nestle, and Viom in all industries. So we are, we, I like to say that we have centuries of eating experience, which is not quite unique to us, but we do have an amazing team that has scaled businesses in the past. We are, are actually this slide is increasingly inaccurate. We've uh, increased the team by 13 people since I put it together. So it's kind of like already old. <laughs> we have an amazing team of, a, a team of advisors and investors that have come through the time, uh, everything from venture capitalists to uh, other uh, entrepreneurs and, and industry leaders. And we are right now in the process of closing our seed extension. It's a 10, it's a 2 million seed extension. We've raised 5 million prior. And this seed extension is, we've received over 1.3 million already and our half commitments for another half a million. So we are in the tail end of this, this is a price round at a 10.5 million pre-money valuation. And this should allow us to get to cash flow positive and raise an A round in the first half of next year. And so at Suggestic, yeah, we are building the tools to enable the full ecosystem to collaborate and help everyone make food as medicine a reality. And with it, help billions of people around the world lead healthier, happier, and longer lives. Oh, thank you, Victor. I feel hungry after your pitch. <laughs> uh, very interesting. Yeah, very promising technology, very promising startup. Oh, investors, I'm sure you have questions. Yeah, and a shout out to Dreamit because we were there four years ago. <laughs> we were, I think, one of the, fir the first healthcare. Uh, uh, so thanks a lot. Yeah, hey, Victor, uh, you, were, you were before my time, but I've heard, uh, you know, great things about your platform, and clearly you're making a lot of progress, so so congrats, but uh, since I got the mic, maybe I'll, I'll uh, hit you with a couple of questions here. Sure. Um, the first one is, what, what is your actual, I didn't quite get it, maybe just flip through the slides very quickly, what is your current recurring revenue? Yeah, we have a 3.2 million is what we have in contracts as. Yeah, so that's, as be, that, that's what you have booked right now. That's booked revenue. Yes. Or is that, is that, so what did you actually do in 20? What will you actually do in 2020? So in 2020, we, we are expecting around half a million dollars in sales, mainly because a lot of that revenue, even if it comes in as a yearly fee is then broken down uh, into monthly uh, revenue and and so and second a lot of the contracts actually get unlocked once they deploy so they start paying uh, upon deployment of their apps so that was why it is important for us to release the android version which we did not have and the android version also allows us to have sdks which have the user interface which normally takes more time to include and that revenue that 3.2 million you mentioned is that sort of locked and loaded revenue or does it depend on utilization of the platform? It is based on the minimum fees in the contracts. So what we have is minimum fees per month, minimum fees. 
and those minimum fees can sometimes get delayed if they don't release. And, but the minimum fees, uh, we are not considering additional per user per month fees on top of that. And we're not considering any of the rev share that is also in, in many of our contracts. Got it. So That's that helpful. is only minimum fees over the next three years. Contracts are an average of three, well, not an average. Uh, most of our contracts are three years uh, in length. Got it. Okay, last question is just switch gears a little bit. Um, lots of logos on your traction slide. Um, I'm trying to get the theme there and what your go to market is. I mean, I'm sure you're not trying to sell to everyone. So sort of what is your go to market? What defines your kind of ideal customer? So right now, what we found is that um, we actually are going after early adopters. And early adopters is a very interesting segment because they want to be the first. We have um, and out of early adopters, we have everything from United Healthcare in one side to startups in, in like my DNA on, uh, uh, or uh, Biome Health or others on the other side. So what we've seen is a common, the ones that are rushing fastest to come in are in the wellness category, direct to consumer health that have either lab test devices um, or some sort of dietary intervention where they can enhance user experience and actually include a new revenue stream. So what we're seeing is there's a lot of customers that by publishing an app with us can convert a one-time DNA test or microbiome tests or into a subscription model. And that's what we are seeing closing first. Uh, however, we have a full branch out throughout the whole ecosystem. We have fitness companies, we have uh, wellness, healthcare, food, we have food delivery companies. So it's, it's really branching out because the new companies that are coming in actually start collaborating with others that we have and they improve the content, they improve the, the, the value of these, uh, this experience to their users. So I would say, but if I had to choose the one that I, we're seeing most traction, just to be clear, is, is in the direct to consumer health. And uh, however, we are starting the pilot test with United Healthcare in, in Q1, and which can really be much, uh, much larger. And we have some large customers like Amway and, 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 and there's a bunch of others in the pipeline as you saw. Uh, but also uh, in the food category, there's a lot. So, but I would say early adopters is one way of looking at it. And as you may recall from Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm, the early adopters, you want, you'll have one or two per industry because they want to be the first. But then as you move to Crossing the Chasm, and that's really potentially, for instance, in relation to Dreaming, uh, what you want to do when going to the healthcare side is have a very uh, a, a unique offering uh, or a very vertical offering. And what we are doing in that realm is a, a CDC's diabetes prevention program. So in the same way, Omada Health has an app for their, uh, for their users. There's 1,500 CDC DPP uh, companies and they don't have an app. So we can provide a white labelable app for those CDC DPP providers and go at risk with them on, on their reimbursement. Um, I have a question here. Um, so, um, uh, so some more details on your business model. So is it basically B to B to C? So uh, our, okay. And so the, the end user basically never pays for, for, for the sub subscription itself or only um, well, a certain share of it. Yeah, so the, the, if they do pay, they pay our customers directly. So okay, we're seeing two models. United Healthcare will give it out to for free to their members, whereas um, DNA will charge a monthly subscription. And then part of that, we they, they turn around and pay, pay us. So you, you're basically not dealing with, with the end consumer, you're always dealing with, with B2B. Correct. Okay, thanks. Thank yeah. you, more questions, please. We, did, we were direct to consumer for a while, so we know we learned a lot. We learned all the pains that come with it. And I think that what we learned the most is 
that it's a highly fragmented ecosystem. So we had a platform that had all these different dietary programs, but in keto, we were not only competing against pure keto apps or pure fasting apps. We were competing against those who are selling you keto bars. So the user acquisition cost is very high when you're trying mm -hmm. to get into pure apps. However, what we're doing as a user experience enhancement, we are getting all those um, bars and like all those food supplements, lab test companies that have a much higher lifetime value and we are enhancing with our digital tools, their own offerings. Got it. Uh, Victor, can you give us a little bit more detail on how your customers use your platform? What do they take? Just take, for instance, your biggest customer. I think you said it's a D2C fitness or healthcare partner. Uh, what exactly do they take from you? And what is the offering that they provide to their end user that they didn't have before? Sure. I think United Healthcare is a very good example. Uh, United Healthcare will be, we're working with the enterprise and individual section, which is their, their they go directly either to employers or individuals for their health insurance. And what they're offering is a United Healthcare branded app that will be delivered um, initially for this pilot test. We will be going after 28,000 people in, in their coaching a group that are coached by Rally Health. As you may know, Rally Health is part of Optum, which is part of United Health Group. At the, so it's a sister company that does the wellness coaching. And what we've done with Rally Health is create four dietary programs aligned with our coaching practices for diabetes, heart health, um, uh, weight loss, and healthy living. And those four programs match their, their coaching and are delivered through the app. So every time you have coaching through Rally Health and you get the app and the app then it gives you the dietary recommendations aligned with that. And so the way they pay us is per member per month. And, and that's, the, that's not only how they're paying us for the pilot, but that's how they will pay us as they roll out to uh, hopefully to the 41 million uh, ENI uh, members. So what they pay, uh, what they pay you for, is the dietary plans that you have created and make it available to their members. No, they, they, well, they, they do. They, in this particular case, they're not paying for that. We are actually giving them that for free because we didn't want to reduce the value of, of the, of the per member per month. The per mem member per month is what they pay. That includes the technology to deliver these programs. And if they were to buy programs outside of United Healthcare and use any other of our partners in there, they would pay for that as well. And we would take a revenue share of that. And in this case in particular, the programs are built by them, by Rally Health. So they're not paying for the programs. They're giving us the content that goes into the platform and that is then delivered through the through the through the app to the United Healthcare app. So they're paying for the platform that you've created to help them Correct. customize the program. And for their white label app, basically. Right. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, more questions? Do you have any more questions, the investors? No? Uh, I'll just make a quick comment because I think it's interesting. And what Victor talked about, you know, starting out B2C, um, great. Great article by Paul Yock in Fast Company. Uh, Paul Yock is one of the founders of Stanford Biodesign Program. Uh, and it's just interesting, in that article, he cites that 61% of digital health companies that start B2C end up pivoting to B2B. Um, and that's probably no surprise to you, Victor, given your sort of experience and pivot that, that you made. But I, I know as investors, we often have sort of an almost immediate allergic reaction when we see a digital health platform that's starting out B2C, when we think there's a real compelling B2B or B2B to C value prop. Um, yeah, and I think that that transition, we started, so early on when we were at DreamIt, we were B2B, we were trying to do a very vertical for diabetes. And we, we found very quickly that it was very hard to actually get all the clinical trials, everything in, and all those docs in the line so that we could actually get to the employers, et cetera. Many companies were trying to do the same. 
And when we went direct to consumer, what we learned was how to create different uh, interventions. And the interesting thing is the most successful ones were 20 times more successful in conversion, retention, every metric than the least. And it didn't have to do with the underlying technology. It had to do with the content itself, with matching what the person wants as a result with what the dietary program and the content are offering. And, and so we've, we've taken both learnings of how can we get through to the businesses in, in the employer side, which is a very different market to ours. We're not selling to employers. We're not selling to, at least not now, to providers. And we are really actually giving them the catalog of our partners so that they can choose which of our partners makes more sense to them. And I think that's how we, it will progress. We will become agnostic. So it, the, the opportunity we did not see until actually United Healthcare asked us to white label the product for them. And, and it got us thinking and we were undergoing the United Healthcare uh, Techstars Accelerator at the time in, in last few of last year. And we realized that it was a great business model if, and we pivoted to that and never looked back. It was amazing how we, we, we've had 170 companies and most of the sales have been myself. So now we're hiring a business development team, but it, it's, it's been a very interesting process. Thank you very much, Victor, uh, for this speech and for answers. I would like to uh, let you know that uh, Victor and Monica and uh, Richard uh, will be presented also at our biohacking congress in uh, Silicon Valley in Menlo Park on November 20th. And uh, we invite uh, investors to join us at the, at the venue. There will be only 50 attendees uh, who will be invited personally. Uh, biohackers, health optimization experts, founders of selected health companies, uh, health technology com technologies uh, and uh, ecological companies and uh, investors and vendors from health tech biotech areas. More than 15 speakers, top speakers, so uh, you can learn from first hands and you actually can start your biohacking journey for health optimization, performance optimization, and longevity if you are not a biohacker yet. So please join us at the venue. Just email me if you would like uh, to join us. For those who can join us uh, uh, in um, Menlo Park, it is still an opportunity to watch live stream because we are going to live stream uh, this event all day for a very big global community. So yeah, uh, you can find the link uh, on our website and uh, get access to live stream. Or join us at the venue, just email me. Uh, and uh, before we finish this uh, meetup, I would like to introduce uh, one more time our team. Uh, and our main fundraising partner who help us select startups and run this uh, fundraising program, Anna and Adrian. So please, uh, Anna and Thank Adrian. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, could you please explain what are our next steps in this program and uh, maybe some insights for investors as well? Oh, sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Julia, and thank you, everybody who joined today. I personally will be uh, in Menlo Park uh, on the Biohacking Congress, so if you'll have a moment to stop by, we'll be more than happy to connect in person. Uh, we have amazing companies. Today you saw just three of them, but we do have more to show you. And you can, of course, personally meet founders, learn more about them, about the deal, about the deal room, some insights of the deal, the dynamic of the deal. Uh, join, um, of course, the current round or maybe uh, get, get your eyes and your hands on the next round uh, to join later if your investment focus is slightly later. Um, and of course, first of all, I would say the most important is to try out all the cool biohacks because I think uh, we all here work in the uh, venture and in the finance. And sometimes you forget that, first of all, it's all about us as humans and about our productivity, about our longevity and our health. So Biohacking Congress will be specifically dedicated to uh, not just connecting with industry peers, uh, but also about implementing some of those technologies and trying them out.
And um, me and Adrian, our main goal, our background, we've been entrepreneurs, investors ourselves. Um, on my side is primarily on software. Adrian has more hardware experience. So we're combining our um, knowledge and expertise and selecting best um, health tech companies for you guys. And again, thank you so much for being here today. Would love to chat more. Thank you, Anna. Thanks uh, for being our partner. And uh, thank you one more time to uh, all our investors who joined us and provided the feedbacks. And uh, we hope that uh, our startups will get success and uh, will close the deals. There is no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> there is only one way forward. OK. Good. Uh, thank you very much. We are looking forward to meeting you at the venue. Uh, just email me or watch live stream and uh, our next uh, meetups and uh, uh, congresses obviously will be announced for you. <laughs> uh, and we will make some follow-ups after, uh, after this event. Uh, hopefully some of them interested in startups <laughs> and would like continue conversation uh, in person chat and emails. Thank you very much. It was great. To Thank have you. you. Today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. See you all very soon. Bye. Bye bye. bye.